it is my great honor to welcome you to the eighth annual Tallinn Eastern Partnership Conference. This is the first time the ICDS has contribut contributed to the organization of this event. I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, our co-organizers, as well as our good partners, the European Commission representation in Estonia, the Swedish and Czech embassies here in Tallinn, for such a fruitful cooperation. Thank you. The Eastern Partnership was established in 2009, and it was a true product of its time, a compromise of a dubious value reached at the moment in history when Europe was hesitant to defend its values and cautious to avoid any steps that might irritate Russia. That era, hopefully, finally ended nine months ago. Today, Ukrainians are defending Europe's fundamental values, freedom and democracy, at the cost of their lives. The European Union has taken a huge step forward in its relationship with our Eastern partners, offering three of them a membership perspective. In June, Ukraine and Moldova re received candidate status. Hopefully, Georgia will soon follow suit. This development explains the title of this year's conference, EU Enlargement and the Eastern Partnership, Europe's New Geopolitical Reality. Dear friends, we hope that all EU member states, as well as prospective members, have the same understanding of what is to come next. That the EU member states are sincere in their promise and will not drag out the accession process indefinitely. And, the poten and that potential new entrants do not delude themselves into believing that their job is over or that the door into the EU will remain open regardless of what they do. These are the topics we will discuss in detail during the day. I wish us all a successful conference. Thank you. And Vivian, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you very much. Thanks a lot to the ICGS for organizing this event. And I think it really brings an added value to the discussions here in Tallinn, but also in general in Europe about where we are with this new geopolitical realities in, uh, in Europe. And uh, when I look at it from the point of view of the European Commission, then of course our aim is to bring our partners in the Western Balkans or in the um, Eastern Partnership uh, partners, as close as possible, as fast as possible. And here we have two tracks. One track is, of course, the accession, the enlargement process. And there we have made good progress. We have, in the Commission, put really enlargement back in the political agenda since the first start of the mandate in 2019. We have this uh, new agreement on the methodology, but above all, of course, we have the actual progress on, on the uh, different phases of the enlargement. And that is not progress because we've been pushing for it from Europe, but also because of the efforts made by our partners. So this is your success. And second track is the deepening of our economic integration. When we look at it, um, we are, of course, facing all those challenges with Russia's war on Ukraine, and let's face it, on European values in general. But you've seen it also that the longer the Russian war lasts, the more determined we are in Brussels and in all the capitals of Europe to stand together and to withstand this. And we know that our investments when it comes to the Western Balkans, but when it comes also now to Ukraine, to Moldova, to the regions at large, are not only useful for our, uh, for our partners there, but also useful in bringing peace, stability and prosperity to Europe as a whole. So it is very much a cooperation. So when we look, and I think the day will all be about looking at our common future together, then... Um, 
it's not, I think, too much to say, especially now with the Christmas time approaching. We are friends, we are working together, but we are also a European family in this um, common um, history and common uh, cultural sphere. And there, when times are getting tough and difficult, a family stands together. So this is what we'll be uh, aiming for in the future as well. Thank you very much, and it's my honor to now invite the Swedish ambassador Ingrid Terstman here, please. Thank you. Minister uh, Reinsalo, uh, dear friends, I'm really looking forward to the discussions here today. Uh, they are very timely and they are very necessary. The title for the 8th Eastern Partnership Conference here, EU Enlargement and the Eastern Partnership in Europe's New Geo Geopolitical Reality, could also be named Europe and the Eastern Partnership at a True Crossroads. Today's discussion aim to be forward-looking and hopefully to begin to forge a path to the next EU enlargement and accession and what kind of partnership Europe needs and wants, if one at all. It is perhaps tempting to declare the Eastern Partnership dead, null and void in the realities that we face today. I think, however, that it's good to also look back and recall that the partnership has faced many challenges during its now 13 years of life and weathered each one. I trust that we who are here today, and I recognize many friends from, from the years past, remember each challenge. The partnership, however, contains a lot. We have built and created a lot over the years. It contains an EU structure. It contains long-term processes. It contains substantial financial mechanisms for EU rapprochement. It contains expectations and work with a broad range of civil society organizations. But not least, it also contains legal commitments on both sides. There have been times in the past when the Easter Partnership has been questions, questioned and to its relevant and also to its future. Each time we have deemed the partnership to be of high value. Sweden believes that also today. When we assume the EU presidency in January, we will face unprecedented challenges, just like the Czech presidency today and the French before that. It is clear that Ukraine and the Russian war against Ukraine will be our number one priority, and this may well come to define our presidency. Our key priority will be to ensure the EU's steadfast support in all dimensions to Ukraine, to ensure that Ukraine wins the war and Russia loses. Sweden will continue our national support, militarily, political and humanitarian, in the future. A second foreign policy priority for our presidency will be the continued pressure on Russia and to keep up EU unity also here. Further sanctions and legal accountability for crimes committed will also be key. Thank you, Minister Reinsalo and Estonia for the lead on the accountability issue. The EU and NATO cannot afford to let the pressure on Russia weaken or Russian perpetrators avoid legal accountability. And a third priority for our presidency will be the Eastern Partnership. How to trick a path forward with the EU accession for Ukraine and Moldova and with a European perspective for Georgia. As a founding parent of the Eastern Partnership, we still believe that it provides value. And we welcome the fact that discussions and consultations among EU member states and partner countries mostly share that view. The associated trios, advancement in reforms and EU rapprochement, must be seen as the great success for partner countries that it is, and also for the EU policies in and with our neighboring region. I am convinced that without the Eastern Partnership, these successes would not have been possible. I hope that today's seminar, with its seminal and challenging, daring, even questions, it will help us all and also our presidency on the road ahead. This is not the time to throw away tools that we have that work. They can seldom be reinvented, but they can be revamped and adjusted. I would like to thank the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, the ICDS, of course, and the Czech Embassy for the great cooperation in the seminar. Thank you. So, good morning and uh, welcome also on, on my behalf. I am 
very pleased to introduce and uh, moderate uh, the first actual session of this uh, conference. And this is a very special session with uh, three uh, prominent uh, keynote speakers, and I will introduce them as we move ahead. Uh, but just a couple of words of introduction, as it has been said already. Um, this time, this year, uh, the Eastern Partnership Conference is special because uh, we are in a new geopolitical reality in Europe and we are discussing not only Eastern Partnership but uh, importantly also uh, enlargement. And uh, it was a historic uh, decision indeed on the EU side to, to um, kind of finally abandon this geopolitical ambiguity that it had for many years uh, towards uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia and other countries in the region and finally to open the way for Ukraine and Moldova with a candidate country status and Georgia with a European perspective uh, to move towards uh, membership. And for this uh, first session, I think it is very fitting that we have uh, um, speakers from three countries, uh, Estonia, Ukraine and uh, Georgia. It's uh, three countries that in the past uh, decades have made great efforts and also sacrifices to pursue a European orientation uh, in order to preserve their sovereignty, being situated next to a major power that is aggressive and has not abandoned its imperialistic attitude to its um, neighbours. And um, looking at the three countries, the speed and, and path of their uh, journey towards uh, Europe has been, of course, somewhat different. Estonia, having been a member in the EU now for many years, has always been a very strong supporter of bringing Ukraine, Georgia and other eastern neighbouring countries uh, closer to the EU and uh, is fully embracing now this new uh, reality that we have in the relationship uh, between uh, EU and, uh, on, the, on the other side, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. So, um, I'm very happy to give the floor now to the first uh, keynote speaker, it's uh, Foreign Minister of Estonia, Mr. Urmas Reinsalo, please. Dear Director Indra Koenig, um, uh, Honorable Ambassadors, their fellow Europeans, and all the guests. The brave fight by Ukraine is now not only defining the future of Ukraine, but Europe as a whole. Ukraine, together with Moldova, has acquired EU membership candidate status and Georgia has clear European perspective. The future of Ukraine and Europe is being decided as we speak in the battlefield in Ukraine. Russian aggression in Ukraine has multifaceted tragic consequences for many regions outside of Europe. As EU leaders have stressed, the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine is having a direct impact as on global food security and affordability. Russian aggression nurtures misery and hunger. And this is all happening despite of false information that Russia is continuously cynically spreading. They are the masters in explaining the black is white or what Russia stands for peace and stability, which is a shame, small lie. What is the purpose of all this? Why is the world's largest country, Bahia, murdering Ukrainian boys and girls and committing genocide against an independent nation? Why is this regime sending thousands of its own people into death? Greatness and respect? Who actually believes that greatness and respect is achieved through fear, and occupation through death and destruction. There is no greatness for Russia waiting at the end of this road. It is a dead end. Light always follows darkness. Every storm brings the sun in the end, and now too. There is a reason to be, in a way, optimistic, not least thanks to the, to the brave, courageous fight of the Ukrainians. And in the past months, Ukrainian forces have taken back thousands of square kilometers of their own land, 
and the international community stands firmly by Ukraine's side. But we are not there yet, and we have a lot to do. We must all do more. We must continue to support Ukraine. It's a crucial, I know it can be sometimes complicated. Every state and region has its own unique experiences, interests, and available resources. It might be all, uh, not always easy to explain to domestic audiences why we must immediately increase all range of conventional weaponry military support to Ukraine when wood and electricity prices continue to rise. Honestly, this is exactly why we have to keep sending weapons, generators, buses, etc. to Ukraine. The more solidarity we can project, the quicker we put an end to the Russian aggression. Until Russia keeps murdering Ukrainians, we must continue to rise the cost of the war for Russia. Yes, it is going to cost ourselves as well. Putin knows that and seeks to use this against us in order to divide us. But we will not fall for that because we know what is in stake. It is our future, our freedom, and our duty as humans. When Ukraine will lose this war, literally, it will be very difficult for us. Our people look to the mirror. So Ukraine has to win. It is a question of our humanity and our responsibility of human beings. Dear friends, let me state that uh, today we will discuss where we stand in the enlargement process. In order to push things forward, certain reforms have to be implemented, not to please the European Commission or any individual member state, but primarily to move forward as societies, to grow internally, to increase resilience, standard of living, and to strengthen cohesion. Enlargement and reforms are two sides of the same coin. The faster, more thorough the reforms the faster and the more smoothly the membership will become reality. Also very important, the more effective the reforms, the stronger European Union we will end up with. It is clear that the rule of law, well-functioning, impartial judicial system, and effective fight against corruption make a sine qua non for accession, even for opening accession negotiations and making significant progress there. Estonia has been working a lot on passing our reform know-how and EU accession experience to candidate countries. And we will keep doing this until they become EU members. Their success is really a key priority for us. And we feel your hope. And we feel also the pain if their practical deliverers might be over the hills in many cases, and we remember our past in that context very well. So for years, Estonia has been passing on the experience that we gained ourselves during EU accession process to Western Balkan countries. Past months have clearly created new impetus with new possibilities for the candidate countries in the region, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Albania, and Serbia. And uh, let me particularly stress, in these harsh times, the importance to follow European Union common security and foreign policy. And what was this momentum in New York? I looked where Serbian Foreign Minister co-signed a uh, whatever diplomatic uh, cooperation protocol with Foreign Minister Lavrov. This is a fully wrong message. This is a breaking uh, away from the European course values and joint security interest. Needless to say that we will keep supporting Western Balkan countries in their endeavors towards EU. We will welcome recent progress made in Berlin process with concrete results that concern free movement of people, energy efficiency and cooperation in the fields of youth and culture. These are important steps forward. Additionally, I dare to believe that Western Balkan path so far 
with the setbacks and successes in reform process and alignment with EU acquis is definitely something especially valuable for new candidate countries, Ukraine and Moldova. And as we have that diplomatic initiative as Berlin process, let me vision also that in enlargement of Eastern direction, there is needed a similar diplomatic initiative of like-minded countries to invest, uh, to support, to invest to dedication, and to invest also to political decisions delivery. Friends, Estonia firmly believes that the judgment about the death of Eastern partnership is fully uh, wrong. Vice versa, we need an instrument to strengthen the ties more than ever. We are discussing also here today how to fine tune the Eastern partnership so that it can live up to the challenges in a changing geopolitical situation. Ukraine and Moldova have acquired EU membership candidate status and Georgia has a clear European perspective. Armenia and Azerbaijan have indicated that they are continuously ready and interested in intensified cooperation based on Eastern partnership framework. And the door is not closed for Belarus as well, uh, but of course uh, it, uh, the precondition uh, in a perspective obviously is a, a fall of uh, a dictator. But we all know that firm and lasting democratic shift have to take place so that EU could welcome Belarus again as Eastern partner. Belarusian civic society, uh, a brave civic resistant against dictatorship, is indeed cooperating on various pressing issues in the margins of Eastern partnership that makes the latter unique multilateral format. I would like to stress once more loud and clear that the Eastern partnership is not contradicting the discussions on EU enlargement. We will never let somebody who wants to see as an uh, Eastern partnership existence to be an excuse or to avoid uh, enlargement of European Union. We will never let it to do it. Quite to the contrary, the Eastern partnership can be a useful instrument for bringing these countries closer to the EU and the Eastern Partnership has served as a beneficial mechanism for exchanging reform experience and can still perfectly serve this purpose. And, um, friends, uh, let me state that uh, the pre now the European security environment is in ruins because there is a large-scale war in Europe. And a precondition of new European security architecture. We should speak openly and with devotedness already today, before the end of war, is that there should be not after the war, after the Ukrainian victory, a moment where Kremlin continues to dictate its neighbors, its future, its security options and its way of life. If it will be still the case, so these sacrifices, in a way, have been worthless. And so this is our responsibility for the sake of Ukraine, for the sake of all neighbors of Russia, all European nations, that we are aware that Ukraine has to win and there should be such European security architecture which gives no moment of dictating Kremlin over the future of Europe or any European other nation. So, thank you very much indeed. Uh, minister for these uh, strong messages and we have time now for a couple of uh, questions um, while you are thinking I will start uh, with a question myself and Minister Reinsalo you stressed in your speech how important it is now for like-minded countries in the EU to work hard to make sure that uh, the enlargement uh, process for Ukraine and Moldova 
moves ahead, uh, that it does not get uh, stalled. So can you say a bit more about how to do this and also what is your answer uh, to those uh, member states uh, that uh, stress that before any further enlargement of the EU, there have to be reforms inside the EU and there has to be deepening of uh, integration in order for the EU to be able to welcome new members. This will also be one uh, difficult issue in the discussions in, in the years ahead. So how to make sure the enlargement process uh, moves ahead and we manage to keep the EU committed? Of course, uh, Estonia is a strong proponent to the objective criteria and objective deliverable, uh, delivery of uh, candidate aspirant countries. There is no uh, any uh, caveat in that sense. But still we have to admit at the very end it is a political decision. And there might be um, a grand set of excuses uh, why uh, enlargement uh, would not be possible or put uh, uh, vast preconditions which could not be the case and which could be used as to postpone uh, the political decisions. So we in Estonia are practical. We are like Americans, how they say, you can walk and chew the gun in the same time. So we can uh, invest on uh, any kind of reform processes of uh, internal decision-making of EU and at the same time uh, work on enlargement. And, uh, well, um, Ukrainian friends were very smart when they said that, okay, the, if there is a issue of uh, consensus, uh, unanimity issue, that Ukraine can, Ukraine can say that, okay, this is not the case in foreign or security policy in future, uh, that we, we, we can work out this also in negotiations uh, of accession. And uh, what is important is indeed we already had about um, before last European foreign ministers meeting a dinner of uh, several countries, Nordic countries, uh, Central Eastern European countries, and we, we discussed also options how to support Eastern large enlargement uh, uh, and also uh, about opportunities to create similar mechanism as Berlin process has been a role model. Thank you, and I think I saw a hand up over there, my colleague Stephen Blockmans, who is a senior fellow of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at ICDS, uh, please, and the mic is coming. Minister, thank you very much for, uh, for your intervention. Um, very passionate indeed and, and forceful. Just the kind of message I think uh, we were all expecting from you and which Ukraine certainly needs to hear. One of the uh, initiatives that Estonia has been uh, pushing for is accountability of, uh, on the Russian side, of course, for war crimes, etc. In, in this respect, I would want to ask you whether you consider the sustained attacks on energy infrastructures, on medical uh, facilities as attaining uh, a, f a genocidal scale. There has been, of course, at the beginning of the war, um, a lot of discussion about the declared genocidal intent of Russia. And I wonder what you see, despite the change in narratives on the Russian side, the practice still being sustained in this respect. That's one side of the question. The flip side of that is, of course, we've seen the much criticized Amnesty International uh, report on alleged war crimes uh, on the hands of Ukrainian armed forces, is whether in the EU enlargement process, where we have the example of the Western Balkans and the introduction of uh, a conditionality uh, which requires uh, cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and The Hague, whether a similar type of structure ought to be created uh, in order to accompany um, the transitional justice, the search for transitional justice uh, in Ukraine itself. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the intent of Putin and his accomplices has been uh, rather clear. Uh, it is a full denial of uh, existence of Ukrainian uh, nation as such. That, we're, that what they are speaking about, the denazification, is basically de ukrainization And if we look, this list of uh, genocidal intent 
um, crimes which uh, have taken place in the occupied areas, uh, forced deportations, uh, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, mm, banning of uh, and, uh, and destruction of Ukra books written in Ukrainian, uh, banning the Ukrainian language in schools, and this is a vast list. So the one thing is indeed a physical annihilation of people whose uh, responsibility solely for the execute, executioners is that they are by their nationality Ukrainians is another is is, is a is, is a, mm, intent of uh, destruction of uh, Ukrainian nation as a culture and socio economic unit and uh, the tribunal in that context but also as there are several examples of uh, of uh, uh, any uh, different uh, uh, hybrid tribunals, uh, this would solely uh, deal with the crime of aggression. So the, uh, there are already 50,000 crimes registered now, the war crimes, uh, crimes committed by uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Russian uh, forces. But uh, what is important is that the um, crime of aggression doesn't fall into the competence of ICC. So we do not anyhow say it, it is going to be a, as a replacement of ICC competence. No, we are full advocates of ICC uh, comprehensive uh, work uh, uh, on, on this uh, field. But the crime of aggression needs to be dealt separately. And to these basic and core responsible people's uh, issue who pass the decision to launch this genocidal war. And I think this will be, the issue of this tribunal will be also a lacmus to world, lacmus to European leaders, European people. If they could anyhow imagine that they will be sitting uh, over the negotiations table with the persons who should be under the tribunal, who have committed crimes against humanity, uh, which uh, have uh, brought uh, unimaginable losses uh, and atrocities. Thank you. Let's take one more final question, and that is from James Sher, also a senior fellow of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at uh, ICDS. Thank you um, again, Minister, for an especially clear and forceful speech. One especially sinister and new aspect of this assault on Ukraine's uh, critical infrastructure and its basic means of survival has been the entry of Iran. Um, its drones have very powerful resonance for anyone uh, here who is British, uh, who remembers the buzz bombs of the Second World War, and now there is disturbing indication that ballistic missiles will be added to this equation. And what is doubly sinister is that Ukraine has never attacked Iran, Ukraine has never shown hostility to Iran, and yet it has, uh, is now playing a critical role in this conflict. My question is obvious. In these circumstances, uh, is it not appropriate, indeed urgent, for the EU to state that there can be no continuation of business as usual with Iran uh, in view of these events? Yes, I fully agree with your uh, uh, position in that sense. We have to say that the price is going to be overwhelmingly heavy to all these authoritarians who would m think that they could make uh, business uh, out of this war, uh, doing uh, the business with the uh, aggressor, or even to try to, in a politically motivated uh, basis, to in harm the West 
in that context uh, uh, to invest to the aggressor state uh, interests. So there is no case that uh, uh, I called also in the last European Union foreign ministers meeting that we should put a clear set of preemptive sanctions already to the air, comprehensive sanctions, that uh, they would know where, what this uh, uh, intent uh, will bring. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply uh, sorry that we couldn't make that, uh, uh, Western community couldn't make that before this stage of war start uh, also this preemptive sanctions list uh, against, uh, um, against Russia if the war could, could start. But, so that is a momentum and we have learned also from the near past in that context, in a way, mistakes. That this is, Putin has stated clearly it is all in uh, to him, to the, his strategic intent and uh, our, it means that symmetrically our determination uh, uh, should be stronger. And uh, what is the strong um, pledge I make to all my uh, colleagues who do have a long-range uh, weapon system, particularly long-range uh, missiles, give it to Ukrainians. They need also to balance the situation where basically it is annihilated, their civic infrastructure. They need also somehow how to deter uh, the beast. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, once again, uh, for this uh, political determination and moral clarity. We will need uh, more of it. And now it is time to move uh, to the next uh, speaker who will join us uh, by video link. Uh, it is uh, Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Ukraine, Olha Stefanishina, who has been in this position since uh, June 2020 and uh, has been working for many years uh, in the, the Ukrainian government in various positions uh, related to international and European law. And uh, um, so uh, now, indeed, it's her primary task to work on Ukraine's integration uh, to the EU and NATO. Dear participants of the conference, it's a great pleasure for me to have a chance to address you. Ukraine and European Union has already been in a very lasting and productive cooperation. This experience since 2009 of our collaboration has been developed in the framework of the Eastern Partnership. Today, this format marks 13 years of existence. It allows us to evaluate retrospectively the effectiveness of this initiative and what's important to analyze mistakes and conclusions accordingly to be done. Eastern Partnership has been created under the influence of a number of factors. What, on one end, it was the request from the countries of the region to deeper integration with the EU, deeper the cooperation, and on the other hand, there was the unreadiness of the European Union to expand an emergent security threats in the region. This framework led to launch of an initiative that opened up opportunities for intensified cooperation, but left the region in a moment of strategic uncertainty. And as a result, it allowed Russia to gradually increase its influence in the neighboring countries. One of the countries is currently used by Russia as its own military training ground for armed aggression against Ukraine. This is one more important thing. The package principles, the group principles of the initiative makes the Eastern Partnership too ambitious for some countries and not ambitious enough for over the time for the others and useless for the third ones. As a result, this made the format almost uninteresting for all its participants at the same time, although it has always remained important for the EU. This is the EU format. Along with that, Eastern Partnership has created a number of opportunities and has its own success stories. As part of this initiative, Ukraine has carried out a number of progressive reforms which granted us a visa-free regime, made citizens of Ukraine and EU closer to each other. Being part of Eastern Partnership, we finished the negotiations and concluded the association agreement, which became the main reference point for further cooperation. Over eight years, Ukraine has implemented more than 60% of the legal approximation obligations under the agreement. This is a huge base of implemented EU key into the national legislation. In many sectors of economy, Ukraine has already acted close to EU member states. 
This is, for example, allowed us to synchronize with the European electricity market already being within a full scale war. But this, this, the leadership which has been inspired by Ukraine itself and affected uh, various transformations and outcomes of the Eastern Partnership generally. So the bilateral agenda should be the driver of any geopolitical fallment. The development of a resilient democracy in Ukraine, which uh, authoritarian Russia considered as a threat to the regime, as a threat to the country itself, and the policy of strategic ambiguity and certainty of the European Atlantic community regarding the region became a trigger, a yes button, a green button for Kremlin to launch a full-scale war against Ukraine, having in mind that there's no consequences to be bad for that as we are not needed anywhere. This is the major narrative which has been cultivated for decades by Russian Federation. An absolutely failed policy is collapsing thanks to the professional actions of the armed forces of Ukraine, as well as due to the support of our partners. Granting the status of a candidate country for Ukraine has been a historically important step, both for Ukraine but also for you. This step has sent a very clear signal. Ukraine has been and will remain part of Europe. And militaristic policy of establishing spheres of influence in Europe will only end in defeat. However, the decision on candidate status was not just gifted to Ukraine. This has this is a logical result of the transformation we carried out together with the EU, suing ourselves with the family of European nations. This has been our choice. This has not been enshrined to us by any formats or any ideology. Today, Ukraine implements a unique reform practice. A unique reform practice which should lead to reforms within the EU itself. In the conditions of the strict military re restrictions, we are ready to implement the recommendations of the European Commission aimed at the most ambitious areas of our country, including judi judiciary. We made already good progress in these directions and we do not see any obstacles to not starting the accession negotiations in 2023. At the same time, Bureaucracy of package principles, of formats, of areas should not be allowed to become the inhibiting factors. And here where we have to make sure that the lessons of the past are learned. We are moving, we are moving forward to become part of European Union and nothing can stop us, even the shelling or any other threats from our neighbors. Russian Federation also makes it vital for your Atlantic community to review its official strategies regarding relations with the Russian Federation herself. Support for the EU's neighbors, in particular through the enlargement policy, should be among the priorities of such strategy. This is a step towards ending the era of strategic uncertainty in Europe. And the European Union determination and commitment to respond to the challenges will increasingly strengthen and be needed to block potential shape of the international agenda in the turn of protecting and supporting and cherishing the values we all believe. Such a brand new and all-in-one approach is a necessary investment in peace and prosperity in Europe. Ukraine have been, is, and will always be over the table of this future prosperous Europe, regardless the format, but stronger we are together. Slava Ukraini! So no doubt about Ukraine's high level of ambition and determination. There were many important uh, points I'm sure we will come back to later today, both regarding issues where the EU failed or underperformed in the past years and uh, what needs to be done in the coming years to ensure uh, lasting stability and <coughs> peace and prosperity in Europe, including uh, Ukraine. 
But now we move on to the third uh, speaker of this uh, session, uh, Mr. Teimuras uh, Janjalia, who is uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Georgia since uh, June 2021 and previously has held various key positions in the Georgian Foreign Ministry. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. At the outset, uh, I'd like to thank the International Center for Defense and uh, Security and the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing this event. The suggested topic of the conference is very timely and uh, really targets the questions, uh, issues that we are all keen to find answers and solutions. In this rapidly changing uh, geopolitical reality with seriously shaken security architecture of Europe, we need to make inevitable policy adjustments to our cooperation formats. New decisions should be based on the clear understanding of the strategic reason for the Eastern European region. The EU should maximize its efforts to export to export a sustainable peace and therein in order to safeguard long-lasting stability and unhindered peaceful development of the entire Europe. Historic decision of the European Council back in June opened a new chapter, not only in our relations with the European Union, but also revitalized youth enlargement policy to prove again that it truly is a geostrategic investment in peace, stability, security, and economic growth in the whole Europe. It has been a clear message that nothing can stop the expansion of democratic values, freedom, and that Europe is united as never before. Years after the Russia-Georgia August 2008 war and an accession of Crimea in 2014, ongoing Russian aggression in Ukraine has been a real wake-up call for Europe that made it clear that security in Eastern European partner countries is intermined with the security of the European Union. It demonstrated the very truth that this European project was far from being complete without Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. In her State of the Union address, President Ursula von der Leyen explicitly confirmed this. Recognizing European perspective for Georgia is an unprecedented milestone which opens new opportunities and sets new standards in our relations. It puts Georgia where it naturally belongs to, culturally, socially, and politically. Georgia always affiliated itself with Europe and has fought its share of fight to defend the very values and principles that the European civilization stands for. I think Georgia has much to offer to the EU, a unique culture to enrich further European diversity, a steady drive towards democracy, and a strong foothold for the EU in a geopolitically turbulent region, a crucial link on the EU's global connectivity map, thanks for its geostrategic location as a Black Sea littoral state and a game changer when it comes to diversification of transport roads and energy supply to Europe. A reliable and committed security partner standing by the EU side in its peace efforts around the globe. So the European perspective comes with a huge responsibility to ensure highest political, economic and legal convergence with the European Union. But our resolve and motivation to go down this path is as strong as ever before. These developments clearly influence the future configuration and purpose of the Eastern Partnership as well. The Eastern Partnership has definitely played a positive role in ensuring Eastern Partners' political association and economic integration with the European Union. According to the will and readiness of the partners and in the frames of the political mandate given to this policy initiative 13 years ago. In a dramatically changed geopolitical environment, when even in the circumstances when the three Eastern partner, partners, Eastern, uh, uh, partner countries, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, have applied for the EU membership and are pursuing their EU integration goals already under the EU enlargement package, we realize that it's still beneficial for the EU and the Eastern partners to maintain a common policy framework of the Eastern partnership, 
in order to secure and further expand bonds that have already been built and also to ensure use meaningful, tangible engagement presence in the whole region. On the other hand, it's essential to maintain Eastern partnership relevance, which is impossible with applying even more differentiation and develop tailored merit approach. We recommend it to focus more on security cooperation stems, whether it's soft or hard security, if words aimed at encountering hybrid threats and disinformation deepening cooperation within the CSDP dimensions as well as link up with other EU security related tools such as the European Peace Facility, for instance. Another crucial dimension which we advocate within the Eastern Partnership is connectivity. You will all agree that it represents a common interest in this highly vulnerable and at the same time interdependent environment. In Georgia's case, it first and foremost concerns transport, energy, and digital connectivity through the Black Sea. Several high-profile flagship projects under the Eastern Partnership Economic and Investment Plan are now in the pipeline such as construction of the high voltage electricity transmission cable line and the fiber optic cable both to be laid on the Black Sea as well as upgrading ferry transportation across the Black Sea for improved physical connectivity. These projects bear special value not only for Georgia and the European Union but the whole region by extending potential for developing renewable energy sources, sustainable growth, trade connections and people to people contacts. On this line, I want to highlight and welcome the recent visit of the Commissioner Oliver Varhey in Georgia that gave us a good opportunity to have a very subject-oriented discussions on how to proceed with the implementation of these concrete projects. We continue to benefit from the goals that we have set together with the Eastern, within the Eastern Partnership, which we are now in the process of materializing. For instance, we have recently applied for the single euro payment area after some serious financial adjustments and reforms carried out internally. We hope this will be concluded soon and our citizens will see yet another tangible results of closer integration within the, with the European Union. The same goes with the free roaming area, which has also been worked out within the Easter Partnership. These are concrete examples of the cooperation schemes that we are interested to develop in the future as well. So, Overall, we are ready to continue our constructive engagement within the Eastern Partnership and contribute to its successful functioning as a pragmatic framework for enhancing of the region toward security threats and for promoting better connectivity with the European Union. We hope that the Eastern Partnership will serve as a pragmatic mechanism to ensure Black Sea connectivity within the broader connectivity domain and facilitate implementation of more energy, more transport, and more digital infrastructure projects. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Janjalia. Now we have uh, a few minutes for one or two questions. Um, thank you for um, your very concrete uh, points on what uh, Georgia in the current uh, situation expects from the Eastern Partnership uh, policy. You highlighted uh, cooperation on security matters in particular, also connectivity and uh, energy. Uh, so um, these are issues that uh, you wish to further pursue in the framework of the Eastern Partnership. But how do you see the relationship uh, between the policies of the Eastern Partnership and uh, enlargement of the EU that are now both uh, simultaneously uh, on the agenda for some of the Eastern partner countries. Thank you very much for this question. And uh, it is raised uh, from, from uh, the early uh, March and uh, beginning of this year when we have applied for the membership. And we always are saying that there is uh, only an addition to each other of these uh, two dimensions. Because when we are talking about the Easter Partnership and when we are talking about the association agreement, which we had uh, thanks to the Easter Partnership, so and uh, we would like to always, and we are raising this issue, that we are implementing the Easter Association Agreement fully and that we have elaborated the new association agenda just recently for eight years. That it means that we are devoted to the process 
and we are devoted to the implementation. At the same time, so we are, of course, in a new frames as we applied for the membership, and we are going to even more actively and to accelerate the process of uh, internal reformation, uh, approximation with the UQ, and uh, make much more stronger our devotion towards uh, our main goal, which is the European Union membership. So, of course, there is a Easter partnership, and there is a uh, another direction where the three associated partners applied for the membership, but I think that it adds to each other and uh, it uh, supports both these initiatives. Uh, in one initiative supports another uh, goal to, to, to become a member of the European Union. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any hands up, so I think we have all uh, deserved a, a coffee break. Uh, thank you to all the speakers of the first uh, session, and uh, this session is now closed, uh, but please be back here in, in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
Distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to um, uh, start now our uh, panel <coughs> discussion on EU enlargement, how to make it happen. And I am um, uh, Marika Lintem from the Estonian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Director General for Europe and uh, uh, EU Affairs, including enlargement. Uh, and um, I am very happy to have uh, on the panel uh, with me uh, Dr. Lyubov Akulenko uh, from Ukraine, Executive Director of the Ukrainian Center for European Policy. Uh, also, uh, Mrs. Kalinka Gaber, State Advisor for Policy De Development and Coordination in the Government of North Macedonia. Uh, and uh, Mr. Jaap Fredericks, Ambassador and Special Representative for Eastern Partnership in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Uh, as well as Mr. Stephen Blockmans, Senior Fellow uh, of the uh, Estonian uh, uh, Foreign Policy Institute uh, at the ICDS, uh, and uh, um, someone who has written many works on uh, uh, EU um, uh, foreign policy and uh, Western Balkans and, um, uh, and the Eastern Partnership countries. And um, to um, give you an overview of uh, our panel, uh, I hope first that we can uh, discuss uh, together where we are in the uh, enlargement process and, uh, and also, of course, uh, the main challenges and, and how to uh, uh, keep it um, something uh, tangible, uh, uh, the integration itself, something that happens uh, uh, all along the way of uh, also um, accession negotiations. <coughs> and then also leave time for questions and comments um, uh, from uh, the audience, so that we can have a good discussion together with all of you uh, on these issues. As many um, uh, speakers before pointed out, uh, we have witnessed a historic decision uh, by the European Council this year on uh, giving candidacy status to Ukraine and Moldova and clear EU perspective to Georgia, and also uh, decisions on uh, starting negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. And this is something that um, we believe uh, is really an invigoration of the enlargement process um, that has brought geopolitics clearly back to this policy that uh, some have said is the most successful EU policy, perhaps. Uh, the most successful in enlarging the area of peace and security and stability uh, in Europe and uh, bringing uh, prosperity. And um, the aim of it, of course, is uh, to um, ensure that uh, 
we are indeed stronger together. And the whole enlargement process, uh, of course, uh, is to bring us closer to this reality. And um, I would now um, uh, start uh, with our discussion, uh, turning uh, first to uh, Lyubov from Ukraine, uh, from the country that is currently uh, standing against a Russian aggression and um, can count on all support, of course, uh, from Estonia, as our minister uh, has just outlined, and uh, that includes the support to the um, EU uh, enlargement process. Uh, with regard to Ukraine, uh, as well as we have been supporters of enlargement policy um, strongly uh, for a long time. Um, this year, uh, of course, has changed the perspectives uh, because of the war, uh, and um, uh, it has brought about this new reality of uh, enlarging the circle of candidate countries also to uh, Ukraine, which we are very, very happy about. And, um, Lyubov, it would be very interesting to hear from your perspective. How do you see the, uh, the current uh, enlargement process where we are? And uh, uh, what is the outlook or the expectations for the years to come? And um, uh, all of this, of course, from the perspective of uh, Ukraine. Please. Thank you very much, uh, dear guests. I am grateful a lot to the organizers that they provide me an opportunity to speak in front of you. And also, I am grateful a lot to Ukrainian army uh, because uh, they provide me an opportunity to analyze and uh, to work as an expert in, in Ukraine. It's not so easy uh, because when you have electricity for three hours during the day, so it's like a big challenge. From the expert in uh, politics, I am becoming an expert in electricity and other stuff because you need to think about how to survive. Um, I want to say a few words who I am. I represent Ukrainian think tank, who was established in 2015 after the Revolution of Dignity. And we decided to push all our expertise and energy into the advocacy of association agreement in Ukraine. So we did a lot of work in the parliament and with our government to help them uh, to implement all this uh, key, you know. Very often you need to have a constant stimulation. You need to, fi to find this stimulation. It was not so easy because legislation is complicated and we did not have any EU perspective, so this task was very challenging to us. And my speech today will be connected a lot to, to my experience with association agreement. I think that now it is obvious that it is a historical momentum that Ukraine should use now to become a real member of EU and not to stuck uh, in the candidacy status for ages. To avoid this situation, I think that uh, set of steps should be done both from EU side and from Ukrainian side. So I would like to start with challenges. Uh, when we start analyze challenges from EU side, uh, we decided that the most important it will be to analyze uh, mistakes that were made by EU in the region of Western Balkans. And from the Ukrainian perspective, I think that EU should avoid several set of mistakes. The first mistake that EU should avoid in cooperation with Ukraine is the policy of stabilitocracy. Um, this policy uh, that EU used in the Western Balkans when they made a priority for stabilization instead of stimulation of vital reforms in the region of Western Balkans. I'm pretty sure that EU enlargement policy is a very effective instrument that can help such countries as Ukraine, Northern Macedonia and other countries to implement deep economical, political and social reforms. And uh, EU should use this instrument and to avoid this mistake with Ukraine. Because Ukraine is a big country with uh, lots of group of interests and of course, Ukraine, if there is an opportunity not to implement the reform, if there are challenges, I think that Ukraine can repeat such an experience, and I do not want this. 
The second recommendation is contradictory bilateral issues that happened in the region of Western Balkans. The story of Northern Macedonia is famous, is familiar, I think, that to, to all of you, that some, cra not crazy, but absurd disputes between Northern Macedonia and Bulgaria and Greece blocked the negotiation process for ages. And I suppose that Ukraine can have such challenge with Bulgaria, uh, sorry, not Bulgaria, but Hungary, since we have hun Hungarian minority in the Carpathia. And I 100 have a prediction that we can have disputes on uh, educational issues and language issues. And I think that EU should help us to avoid such, such a story. Now we are living in challenges times, so EU need to think about some progressive decisions. I think that here EU should start to think about the introduction of the system of penalties for those EU countries who are trying to intentionally block the integration process for candidacy countries. I think it is the time to think about this now. And the second recommendation, not to join countries, as it was done in uh, the region of Western Balkans. Ukraine is not an appropriate case. Ukraine is a big country, and if you do not want to uh, stop the progress, you need to estimate the progress of each country separately. It's my personal point of view. And the uh, sad recommendation, it's about the geopolitical role of EU. In June 2022, EU showed to us that it is, has political power and it is a leader in the region uh, with countries that are on enlargement track. I mean, EU was eager to provide for Ukraine and for Moldova candidacy status, but now EU should also continue this line. We should not have a situation when among countries or among candidacy countries, we have some countries that on one hand are looking at Moscow and the on the other hand, they are looking on EU. I am speaking about Serbia. EU should be very strict on, on this line. If we are in one basket, if we are candidacy, if we all are received this status, our foreign policy should go in one line and not in parallel lines. So here are, it's, it's my expert point of view on challenges that EU need to deliver now, not to copy mistakes of Western Balkans with Ukraine. If I have time to speak about current status, I can continue, or if not, I can stop. Maybe we wish. can, thank you very much, Lubav. Maybe we can come back to this. Mm -hmm. I would like to um, give the floor now to uh, Kalinka. Uh, you see that um, from Ukraine, the eyes uh, have been very much on uh, also how the Western Balkans countries have uh, um, moved um, uh, towards opening the accession negotiations, how the enlargement process has taken place so far. And, and now, uh, from your perspective, um, from, from the, a veteran's perspective, from the uh, country, <laughs> yes, who has been a candidate since uh, 2005. 2005. Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to the organizers uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's, uh, this is a new uh, setting and environment. Uh, we don't have, unfortunately, a lot of chances to discuss on the issues that we share with the countries from the Eastern Partnership. So this has also been an eye-opening uh, for me. Uh, maybe with a dose of self-criticism, we have been so self-absorbed in our situation in the Western Balkan countries, being expert not only on our uh, national circumstances, but also the regional uh, discussions, that uh, we haven't been really aware of the discussions that are uh, happening elsewhere. And I'm really uh, glad and, and happy that our experience is also um, studied and, and perceived by uh, countries in the Eastern Partnership because it is a relevant experience, as uh, Lyubov uh, rightly pointed out. Um, I'm not going to repeat uh, what Lyubov said, because those were the main points of my uh, address as well. So uh, yes, uh, EU should insist on democracy and not on stability, uh, because the Western Balkans is a case in the point of how 
appeasing um, certain uh, political uh, leaders and establishments uh, just because they promise to deliver on the European agenda can, can fire back not only for the countries themselves, uh, but also for the credibility of EU's policies. And uh, North Macedonia, uh, under Gruevsky being case in the point, the developments in uh, Serbia and in Bosnia and Herzegovina recently, Kosovo as well, um, are not pointing in, in the right direction uh, in this regard. So uh, what is expected of, of uh, the society in, in the Western Balkans, but I completely commend that this is something that uh, societies in the countries of the Eastern Partnership are also expecting, is a clear message and expectations. And um, as we say, dotting the I's and crossing the T's of what's right and what's wrong in this, in this process of um, approaching the, the European Union, because there is an impression, at least in my part of the world, um, that there is a tendency to perceive, but also being pushed lately with all the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis and the economic crisis and the energy crisis that we've been experiencing, to kind of present the EU as an ATM machine. We don't really speak a lot, or we tend to put to the side uh, discussions about the values and the principles. And I think that the Western Balkans, and especially North Macedonia, with everything that it has gone through in the past 17 plus years, so just for the sake of uh, those in the audience that don't really know, we were blocked in the process for two decades almost because of a name issue with Greece we decided to change the constitutional name of the country from the Republic of Macedonia to the Republic of North Macedonia. And then once that, was, that hurdle was overcome, we have another hurdle in a Bulgarian veto over issues that do not make part of 24th, 21st century discourses, so issues about identity and national belonging and language. Uh, so, going back to, to my, my argument, there should be more insistence on the values and the principles that make us all European. So Ukraine is currently defending the European values and principles uh, through this terrible war of aggression, uh, but we are also doing our share, of course, we cannot compare it uh, to the state of Ukraine, but it's still the same battle for, for values and principles. That's number one. Number two, then again, I'm not, I'll, I'm not copying your, your speech. Uh, it's um, we should the EU should uh, really uh, prevent um, bilateral pro uh, problems being introduced uh, to to the EU EU agenda, because importing uh, bilateral problems in the EU might have consequences at the level of entropy of European institutions, and. Uh, I, I really hope that uh, we can go past beyond this. I don't, I don't know how much uh, provided that uh, the constitutional amendments in Macedonia go through and we move from the stages of bilateral screening into full-fledged uh, accession negotiations. We'll see uh, whether um, this fear that there might be bilateralization of an import of bilateral issues into the negotiations process, whether this will uh, be, be true or not. But this should be definitely uh, prevented uh, in the years to come, not only for the case of, of North Macedonia, but um, also uh, for, um, for those uh, that, that come uh, and undergo the negotiation process uh, after, after us. Um, the EU negotiations and, and, and enlargement policy uh, as a whole um, is a transformative process. It's a lengthy, it's complex, uh, and while in my first part of, of, of discussion I was putting the, the, maybe the focus on, on what the EU should do, we should, uh, the EU should also uh, require a lot from the country. So because it is uh, the journey of transforming the society is not the destination per se. Uh, luckily, uh, there are countries, uh, candidate countries or negotiating countries now that understand that. There are other countries, unfortunately, that are 
kind of bypassing or trying to play around uh, with their commitment to uh, to uh, transformation of their society. But irrespective of everything, um, maybe just a, a closing remark on on the on the state of affairs after the June 2020 uh, EU Council decisions. Um, the EU has re put down really clear criteria uh, on accession on new member states. What we lack from our perspective, maybe, with regards to the enlargement policy, is this double talk and this confusion um, on how prepared the EU itself it has uh, uh, on accepting new member states. So while there are criteria on the accession for candidate countries, there are no criteria on the ability of the EU to accept new member states. So while this might not be a problem for North Macedonia, for example, because we're only 1.8 million, we're not a big market, the market in 15 years of implementation of the stabilization, and no, in 20 years of implementation of the stabilization and association agreement has already been to a large degree integrated with the EU. Over 80% of our experts go to the EU. Countries like Ukraine are a big bite. So we need clear demonstration and, and clear messages uh, from uh, the EU and member states on whether uh, this criteria on the EU's ability to accept uh, new member states uh, will be, because there is a lot of uh, discussions on the EU level that um, in the current context of the institutional structure and the budgetary act, uh, architecture, the EU is not in condition to fulfill the expectations of enlargement, which backfires to the public sentiment back home in declining credibility in the EU. One final not, note, before um, this whole problems with uh, Bulgaria started, well, first with the French veto in 2019, uh, requesting a new methodology and invigorated process of um, accession talks, and then the Bulgarian veto over the, the identity issues. Um, public support for the EU in the country was around 80%. Now it's below 50. The EU does not have uh, the maneuvering room to lose EU enthusiasts and EU Euro, uh, and uh, Europhiles like uh, the citizens of North Macedonia, and I really wouldn't like to see it go that way. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Kalinka, for pointing out uh, perhaps some of them uh, again, but but uh, but uh, some clearly uh, added uh, challenges that um, you have faced on the. Uh, current uh, uh, road towards uh, EU uh, accession. And, um, well, we will come back to, uh, to it in the course of the discussion. Um, I would now like to turn to uh, Jaap and um, the perspective from the Netherlands, one of the founding countries of the EU, on uh, now this current state of um, uh, enlargement process with the, the new big decisions from this year, and how would you see the outlook? Thank you. Um, in June uh, this year, the European Council granted uh, a perspective of membership to three Eastern Partnership countries, three months after a request for membership was, um, was, was formulated by these countries. I believe that seldom before has the EU shown so much unity so much understanding for the geopolitical context and the response it had to give in that regard. The European Commission formulated opinions about uh, the state in which each of these countries was in the context of the geopolitical um, environment and made a to-do list for these countries to move to a next stage. I believe that those opinions gave a good impression and a good analysis of where each of those countries is, and, and therefore um, also indicated how much of the work had already been done through the Eastern Partnership, through the association agendas, um, 
reforms had been initiated by all of those countries um, as required by the Eastern Partnership Programme of Work with regard to uh, the, the fundamentals of, of which the Eastern Partnership is built on, rule of law, minority protection, media freedom, integrity in uh, public administration and the judiciary, but also the DCFTA, as, as one of the speakers said, a number of these, uh, the, 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 the approximation of the, um, the European uh, acquis had already been uh, up and around 50, 60, 65 percent for the, some of the Eastern Partnership countries. So there was a solid basis to build on. I believe that um, as, we, as we move forward, um, to a great extent, now the ball is in uh, each of these candidate countries' own court. Uh, they have a clear to-do list on what to do next, and, and we will support them as much as we can. But what it requires is not just reforms, it also requires the implementation of reforms, and to a great extent, consensus building. As, as we see it, consensus building not only on the part of the, uh, of the, ex uh, the um, uh, candidate member states and the ones with a European perspective, but also in, in our own uh, countries, consensus building. For the, for the candidate countries, I believe the reform agenda cannot just have a horizon up till the next elections. These countries make a choice to be on a path where they will be for the next generations. And therefore, there must be a consensus building within society, within the political community and the business, admin the business community that this is the way to go. That is what we do the reforms for. That's what they do the reforms for. And what we would like to see to move to a next stage is sustained and tangible results, that there is a track record of, of reforms and of results. Because those reforms we need to convince our own parliaments that we can continue with the process of reform. Um, it, is, it is consensus building on both sides. Uh, believe me, we have always been amongst the strictest ones when it comes to EU enlargement. And our Prime Minister has, on the basis of the, 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 um, the opinions that the Commission submitted, been able to persuade parliaments, Parliament to, that this was the good way forward, that this was the necessary steps to make. But we do need continued progress on reforms to take Parliament and Dutch society along in this. And that is a, a two-way street. We will certainly assist these countries in implementing the reforms, but they will be, in the end, the drivers of their own reform program. That is something that we cannot do for them. They, it's their reforms, it's their society that's being reformed. We'll do it, as, we'll, we'll assist as much as we can, but in the end it is their responsibility because it is their choice to be part of this European family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yap. And, uh, and now uh, straight on to uh, Stephen. Um, so what, uh, what conclusions would you draw from also all the, the comments and, and also how from your angle, you would see the, uh, the status of the process of enlargement at the moment and where we are uh, heading. And uh, perhaps also, uh, if you see that whether the um, new uh, methodology that has been mentioned here is something contributive to moving ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the invitation. Um, well, being last in the panel, of course, gives me an opportunity to reflect on what's been said before, and we've had Yubov and uh, Kalinka, of course, um, well, positioning very credible arguments where the EU should reform itself. And Yap uh, insisting also on some of the fundamentals, of course, that need to be adhered to by, by candidates and potential, uh, potential candidate countries. So let me, let me offer maybe, uh, as, as a fourth speaker, uh, a bit of both um, in, in main reflections. What I, see, what I see is the three main challenges 
uh, that have crept in over time in uh, the enlargement uh, process. The first one of which, um, they're, they're, they're pretty obvious, but I think if you, if you pick them apart and you illustrate them, you know, it becomes actually quite clear that these are fundamental challenges. The first one is um, Canada countries are facing growing difficulties in catching up with the European Union. The EU is a fast-moving uh, target. You know, it's a perpetuum mobile which, uh, which you know, continues to develop in, in, in law and standards, um, which is more difficult, you know, to, to a gap to bridge for what are less prepared, poor candidate countries. So it's not only is the socioeconomic gap that needs to be bridged larger, Moldova and Georgia are not Sweden, um, the, the legal approximation effort which needs to be done, the institutional capacity building that needs to be done is, is, is far more demanding in that, uh, in that respect. And in some cases, as was mentioned, the level of domestic political polarization hampers uh, a, un a unified national effort in, uh, in meeting those uh, um, uh, demands. I think we should not forget that um, obtaining membership of the EU is not signing up to an international treaty. It is accession to a thick constitutional order which is built on the principle of mutual recognition that keeps the single market operational and whereby the fundamentals that Jaap referred to, rule of law, democ democratic, uh, well, respect for democratic principles, etc., are essential to keep the EU going. And in that respect, EU enlargement is a trust-building exercise. Yes, it's a two-way street, for sure. The EU uh, needs to be credible in that respect as well. But the onus is first and foremost on the candidates themselves. They have to prove that there are trustworthy peers, future member states with which money, you budget, and power through decision-making processes in the council can be shared. And window dressing is simply insufficient. I mean, there will be always, with the requirement of unanimity, basically, that member state that interprets the membership conditions in the toughest manner, um, being the one that, that could obstruct progress in, in that respect. So th there's a need for overperformance on the side of, uh, of candidates. And I think Estonia actually is, is, is a pretty good example of you know, how uh, this, uh, this could be done. Second point, there's a growing complexity of the enlargement methodology itself. You have Article 49 of the EU Treaty, the Membership Clause, which is just a framework which over time, of course, has been fleshed out in soft law uh, measures and conditions. Uh, the Copenhagen Criteria, with the fourth dreaded Copenhagen Criteria of absorption capacity into the EU being a problematic one, for sure, but then further developed with um, ICTY conditionality uh, for in the stabilization and association process for the Western Balkans, the insistence on regional co economic cooperation, other cooperation, um, with now uh, additional conditions clearly spelled out on um, avoiding, well, getting rid of political polarization, as I mentioned, and de oligarchization, uh, where, well, both the um, conditions prioritized by the Commission in vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis Georgia leave room for different interpretations, uh, by the way. Um, that leads to extra, um, extra complexity, as I said. 35 chapters, uh, opening and closing benchmarks, now in the revised methodology, of course, clustered into six uh, groupings, but with an increasing insistence on fundamentals. Again, opened first, closed uh, last. And um, with all of that, progress being dependent on unanimity between uh, the member states, as I, as I mentioned, uh, which, which is a problem. A third point, and this was mentioned, less predictability uh, in the process itself due to the dreaded fourth uh, Copenhagen uh, criterion, perhaps, and the ongoing debate about widening versus deepening. As I think that actually accession with the European, uh, to the European Union would provide um, opportunity for renovation to the European Union and its institutional procedural structures itself. 
Um, so it's a bit of a, a, a mis, uh, well, a, a difficult conundrum. In fact, is this juxtaposition between uh, widening and deepening. But then, as was mentioned, the nationalization of um, the enlargement process for, frankly, parochial um, reasons internal to member state domestic uh, politics. Um, that is, of course, a, a, the type of hijacking which is intolerable. But let me remind you that it has always been there in the enlargement process. It's nothing new. France blocked the accession of the UK twice. Um, and we've seen, of course, uh, I'm, I'm not justifying this, uh, maybe there's an increase that, uh, that is uh, being witnessed and, and clearly an argument you know, to, uh, to, to um, rid the entire enlargement process from a couple of veto moments, uh, not on the most crucial um, steps, of course, in that process, um, but for the intermediate steps. Final point would here be that, um, well, I mean, enlargement is a political process. And it's not a mathematical uh, equation, um, you know, with, with a set of conditions automatically being, uh, being translated in, uh, in further progress uh, or gains uh, for candidate countries. Um, it is a trust-building uh, exercise, and um, it will remain political, largely political, uh, for the years to come. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, I can... Uh... I, from my part, only really agree that enlargement is perhaps the most um, um, well clearly the, the, the policy where geopolitics meets, meets chapters, clusters, criteria, uh, and um, um, which needs to be driven, taken these two sides into account uh, at the same time, and uh, and of course a very much two-way process. Uh, there has to be uh, the commitment um, to the criteria, to the reforms from one hand side, from the candidate countries, and also, of course, the, um, uh, the uh, movement, uh, constant movement towards the goal of accession uh, as well, so that um, uh, the uh, momentum is not lost uh, on the way. From the Estonian experience that um, uh, Stephen referred to as well, um, for us, it uh, was so important to have this uh, guiding uh, light of uh, EU uh, membership um, in order to help go through um, rather massive reforms uh, sometimes. But, and sometimes, uh, well, doing them um, more than 100%, uh, doing uh, more than 100% of uh, a key um, uh, uh, transposition and uh, and really going the extra mile, uh, but of course this guiding light was always there uh, and um, uh, was not lost from the sight. Um, so, what can we do uh, now in the uh, in the remaining uh, remaining discussion time? Uh, I would like to ask for your opinions as well. What can we do so that um, uh, this light is always there, uh, so that there is constant movement actually towards integration, because it is not just, uh, uh, well, let's say one huge uh, leap, but uh, very many smaller steps on a, on a long way um, of really um, becoming a member of uh, the European Union. So um, perhaps we can uh, have the same around, uh, starting with uh, Lyubov again and, uh, and uh, Kalinka and uh, Jaap and Steven. Uh, Marika, if you do not reject, I would like to react to some of the well, issues of that uh, Stephen mentioned, if you do not reject. Sure. Uh, the first issue that you told is that enlargement process is not a simple mathematic, but it's a political process, and you made an example of Great Britain. Here, I do not agree uh, because of two reasons. First reason, Great Britain is a rich country, and we are in absolutely dif different economical conditions. Second, Great Britain did not have this complicated new enlargement methodology. So I think that now this game is very difficult. And if we all want Ukraine and Western Balkans to succeed, we need to help, maybe with mathematical approach, I do not know. And second issue, uh, you are absolutely right that for Ukraine and other countries in the region, it is not so easy to uh, manage 
but it's possible to manage the legal approximation pro uh, process since, again, the country is not so rich as, as Western countries, West, uh, Western European countries. But I want to admit that there is one issue that differ Ukraine from other countries with candidacy status. We have strong uh, European integration institutional structure. Uh, and also we have pool of Ukrainian experts that uh, know EU are key very well. Uh, by the way, this year, it, uh, every year we are delivering the monitoring report on association agreements that it includes lots of sectors, more than 35 this year. I worry that it will be very difficult to find experts in Ukraine because a lot of them, to be honest, moved to EU. But you know, for one month I managed to find experts. So if to compare with other countries, still Ukraine has a pool of expertise that can be used as a plus to help to implement everything. And now I want to start uh, my speech. What, what Ukraine should do uh, to implement this uh, task with membership. Uh, I want to pay your attention not on legal approximation, but to make a step back. Uh, after Russia started war with Ukraine, uh, I started to speak with our experts. Um, can we, for example, imagine that in one or two months Ukraine can join EU internal market? And I was upset since at that moment I understood that completely I have a conversation with 15, with 15 best Ukrainian experts <coughs> in association agreement and almost they all replied to me that in particular each sectors of association agreement there are huge level of damages. And now for me it is a little bit funny to speak about legal approximation because if you have huge damages in the sector and you are trying to speak about legal approximation, it is not fair. And this is the thing that we need to think about when we are speaking about methodology. This is a particular issue that currently differs us very much from Western Balkans. Now, in case of Ukraine, we need to think how to help us to deliver a special recovery plan, plan for the sectors in the framework of association agreement. I just want you to make examples of several sectors, what problems we are, because we only start this analysis. We start to analyze trade of goods and trade of services, because it is not a normal situation when we are constantly begging money from you. We need to earn money with the help of association agreement. And what we have now? A trade of goods, technical regulation, it is the trade of, of industrial goods. Before war, uh, we, uh, we had an intention to sign with EU the so-called industrial with a free regime or agreement on conformity assessment. And what we have now? Situation is a little bit complicated. Each industry has standards. And institutions are collecting these standards for machinery, for chemical industry, for gas. In, in most of EU countries, these standards are collected in one city, in one institution. In Ukraine, we had another story. In Ukraine, we have a decentralized system when standards are collected in different cities. And 60% of standards of Ukrainian industries are collected in Kharkiv, 20% in Kyiv, and all other percent of standards in Lviv and in Ivano-Frankivsk. Ivano-Frankivsk is collecting standards on gas. On gas. So this metrology uh, infrastructure suffers very much because most of the standards historically we collected in Kharkiv. So here we will need your help how to recover this infrastructure. Another example with agricultural sector. What is going on now? I am happy to hear that our agrarian comp companies are planning to have harvesti harvesting campaign in 2023. 
but they plan to reduce like two times. EU farmers are trying to seed those plants that they did not seed before. For example, like buckwheat, it's hrechka. It is very famous in Ukraine, but it was never popular in EU. We are losing your market, and of course, your farmers uh, and your companies are trying to look for solutions. If Ukraine cannot provide these products, EU is trying to, to provide it by yourself. Currently, lots of uh, animal farms are destroyed. And in 2023, we can have a situation when chicken eggs will disappear from Ukrainian market. So, such is the story, that if uh, we want to survive, we need also to look at this sector. And I will make one example of uh, trade of services, telecommunication sector, digital, that is part of the digital single market. Uh, due to the telecommunication sector, uh, we managed to communicate during the war. It is so important. But only now I understood that infrastructure of our, of our uh, mobile uh, companies is ruined like 50%. And it's physical infrastructure, internet, communication. And we cannot come to them now and ask them to change legislation. We need to help them. Uh, to, to cope with the problems that they have. And I can make other ex examples. I do not want to make an example in, in the energy sector because now it is like a catastrophe for us as Ukrainians uh, to survive. But sector by sector, I can make such, such an example. And what we think EU and Ukraine should do, we, sh we should think about development of such recovery plan, plan for the sectors of the, in the framework of association agreement and to make it a part of negotiations now. Because I think that without this job, it will be just unfair to implement all other tasks in the framework of accession process. And the last think I absolutely support Stephen and uh, Jeb in terms of that we, that Ukraine need to provide results. <clears throat> and Ukraine need to provide results in uh, fundamentals. Here you are absolutely right. And I think that our country till the end of this year should demonstrate uh, good progress with these seven steps in especially in judiciary reform and anti-corruption reform. Now I do not want to make like any conclusions because you know Ukrainians uh, as students are waiting for deadlines. And still I believe that till the end of the year Ukraine will demonstrate bigger progress than it has now. And, uh, but except of these steps, I think that our government also need to think about those reforms that Ukraine need to implement in the framework of these uh, uh, negotiations on uh, fundamentals chapter. And here I think that we will need help from, uh, from EU sector. So. Thank you. We'll come back to concluding remarks, but, uh, but it is just incredible how uh, the people of Ukraine is uh, well, trying to cope with all these challenges that you uh, listed and uh, moving uh, towards the EU uh, accession goal uh, at the same time. And um, perhaps reconstruction and EU integration will need to go hand in hand. Yes. And perhaps this is the, the way of also making it uh, tangible uh, also uh, for Ukraine every, uh, every step of the, of the coming way. But uh, moving on now to uh, Kalinka, the, uh, the view from uh, North Macedonia. How do you see um, the possible, uh, uh, possible uh, tangible, um, uh, let's say, steps that can uh, move you towards EU integration also in parallel to uh, the accession process uh, itself, and together with it, uh, together with this approach of the clusters, together with uh, perhaps uh, some steps uh, closer in integration to the EU single market. 
uh, roaming, something that has been mentioned also uh, um, uh, concerning Ukraine um, and, and other such possible uh, steps. Um, yeah, well, uh, not only we have a new political momentum uh, after the decisions in, in June, but uh, we also have a, a new methodology, as mentioned previously. Uh, and this is not only new for us as a exceeding country, uh, I have a feeling that this is also new for the European Commission as well. Um, because just, you know, the background, if for those of you that uh, don't know it, it's in 2019, uh, President Macron came up uh, at, the, at the European Council with the initiative that uh, the enlargement policy should be reconsidered by a new approach. Um, the uh, Quai d'Orsay was uh, very um, fast in um, bringing out an initiative to the European Commission in, in January of 2020. So by March 2023, the European Commission, um, under the auspices of DG Near, developed the new methodology, which is... Um, quite a different approach to the one that has evolved, I would say, after uh, the Croatian, uh, the Bulgarian and Romanian um, round of enlargement. So yes, uh, the fundamentals first principle remains, but now it has been in a way upgraded with uh, economic uh, criteria to meet, of course, the, the Copenhagen um, philosophy, but then there are two novelties in the new enlargement methodology, which is uh, public administration reform and functioning of democratic institutions. Uh, and there will be benchmarks for the entire fundamentals chapter uh, from uh, the experience we have gathered uh, thus far with the explanatory screenings and the start of the bilaterals only last week. Uh, there will be roadmaps uh, for PAR, so for public administration reform, but we don't really know what that will entail because uh, it seems like, I mean, this is only coming not from somebody who is directly, I mean, I'm in the working, the negotiating group for PAR, so we haven't, um, been provided guidance with what this roadmap would, will entail. And this will be a benchmark for opening up the chapter. So we are in this limbo. And that is, you know, when I referred to the credibility of the process, yes, we need to deliver in order to be perceived as a credible partner, be it, you know, on the fundamentals or, or CFSP or, you know, various uh, different issues, but also, and the methodology says that, the EU needs to deliver accordingly in order to be credible. Uh, so already in the first postulate of this new methodology, both sides are failing. We are window dressing, or some of the countries are window dressing, uh, as, as Stephen rightly pointed out. Uh, but also there is, on the other side, not delivery, not only on the promises made, and this is what scares me the most with the Ukraine. Now there is the political momentum, this new geopolitical situation where a lot of promises are being thrown around. But then the moment the, an individual assessment will need to be made on the practicalities of the negotiating process and, you know, on the boxes that we need to tick, not only in terms of transposition, but also on implementation of the key. I am afraid, and this is only perhaps me being the cynic coming from the veteran of the negotiations, the enlargement process, that, you know, a ramp will be put on the way. And then there will be, you know, either... Uh, and some of the commission services or a member state saying, you know, now you need to deliver on this, 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 and this uh, in order to proceed to, to the next stage. And, and then maybe a brief footnote with regards to France and the UK. They did have an issue, but it was an issue over a key related issues. Identity is not an a key related issue. 
So, I mean, I just want to <laughs> just be, be, be clear on that. I mean, it, it, it's a burden that I carry. You must understand that. Uh, I wanted to point, to point that out. So that's one on, on the credibility. The second postulate on the new methodology is stronger political steer, which I, I fully support, and we as, as North Macedonia fully support. There is a necessity to engage more closely. So we learn in the process, candidate countries learn in the process of the functioning of, of uh, the, the EU institutions. Um, the dynamism is also positive, but as I pointed out, the disclusterization, um, we'll need to see how it will be translated in reality. Uh, apart from the power and the functioning of democratic institutions, there is an additional concern that, at least in our case, we don't have chapters 34 and 35. Of course, these are not a key related chapters, but they are important for the follow-up. So 34 is institutions. It's how the exceeding country will prepare their institutions and their institutional architecture and setup when they become members of the U European Union. This is not part of the new methodology. So what does that mean? That we are just, so the cynics and the, not the cynics, the, the negatives, uh, the negative voices which um, in North Macedonia and in the Western Balkans are inspired by some malign influences, mind you, they always insist on this chapter 34 and why it has not been included in the new methodology and they interpret it as, you know, the EU's um, not uh, clear perspective or sincerity in the enlargement process. Because had they, this, and I'm interpreting positions uh, that are circulating around in the public, had they been really sincere about their willingness of to, to integrate and to enlarge to the Western Balkans, there would have been chapter 34. And this chapter 34 is missing in the new methodology. So this is something that the EU uh, should, should be, should be um, aware of. Um, and then uh, maybe something uh, just to, to wrap this up, uh, because we haven't really touched upon uh, in, in our discussion today. I feel that we, the, the Europhiles and the proponents of enlargement are losing the strategic communication battle. And this is something uh, that uh, should be reconsidered in partnership between the EU and the candidate countries. Um, Russian influence was never very prominent in North Macedonia, um, never very explicit when you compare it to other countries of the Western Balkans. Uh, for example, but now in the past year or so, we've seen great increase of hybrid threats, misinformation, fake news that are clearly uh, inspired and incited from other centers. Uh, and it is something that uh, the governments of the region cannot be, and by the same token, in, in the countries of the Eastern Partnership, um, they cannot be left uh, alone in, in dealing with this because it is something that uh, in this vacuum that now we are living with this um, disrupted, let's say, credibility, it creates a vacuum that can be filled uh, by, by other forces which even in countries that were strongly um, pro-European might uh, stir up some, some different uh, conversations and, and communications. The challenges are really many. And, um, uh, yeah, um, there have been comments about uh, whether the EU is ready itself, whether the member states are really all in in this process. Um, are we? I believe that the opinions that the Commission wrote and submitted to the European Council were, was an honest and sincere analysis of strength and weaknesses of these countries. The conditions mentioned as a to-do list, I believe, are really meant to guide reforms and are in no way a, created as obstacles to move to the next stage. I believe that the reform movement 
can take these um, this, this, this conditions as its guidance and, and therefore are there, are there to move these countries forward, not to hold them behind. And therefore, we're in this together. We're, we're, we, we won't be able to complete this in six months. And it was never meant to be an exercise of just months. Approximation to the EU, preparing for membership under any circumstance is a long-term ambition and a long-term process. And we shouldn't, in, should, didn't give, we shouldn't give the impression that it can be fixed easily. Not for Ukraine under the current circumstances, but it has never been a fix for any country joining the EU. Joining the EU is a tremendous effort because you become part, not of an international organization, but of another way to administer your own country. And therefore, it is a huge endeavor. It'll take time, and we're in this together. And um, Stephen, to round up this, uh, this round, um, are we able to make step-by-step -step progress on the path uh, towards EU accession in case of uh, both the countries in the Western Balkans who are on this path and, and also Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, who are coming um, now from this year on the same road? Yes, um, is the short answer. Um, and in a way, the European Council, in its June conclusions, um, has endorsed that, uh, that view when it said that uh, there should be picking up basically on the revised methodology from February 2020, that there should be um, an increased emphasis on gradual integration of these countries, um, which requires new thinking of which pathways, you know, can be construed so as to bring political, socio-economic benefits um, to candidate countries online, and not having to wait all the way to the moment of actual membership. Um, by the same token, the European Council also introduced uh, the flip side, which is uh, negative conditionality, less for less, basically, when it refers to a notion of reversibility already in ongoing uh, accession negotiations. Um, and of course, there have been concerns uh, in particular over um, Serbia's backsliding on uh, fundamentals um, that yeah, negative conditionality ought to be uh, applied in a more forceful uh, or more, more clear uh, manner. And so uh, as far as gradual integration is concerned, a number of ideas and, uh, have already been implemented, of course, and the, the temporary liberalization of trade uh, for, for Ukraine might indeed uh, lead one to, to think about um, creating a more permanent uh, liberalization, but then runs into the very uh, technical difficulties, infrastructural difficulties, which are being, well, ruined, literally, um, with every day that the war goes on, and thus widens the, uh, the gap that, uh, that Ukraine has to fulfill in order to meet uh, uh, the EU's laws and standards in, uh, in this respect. So that, that's difficult. Connecting Ukraine to the uh, electricity grid was, was, of course, another. The idea to, uh, to include Canada countries in the joint gas purchasing uh, program, the extension of the free roaming zone. The, these are all ideas that, uh, that have been out there. What, what will be the next steps for gradual integration there? I think they're primarily in the sphere of a key light uh, chapters. You know, th th there might be on, on cyber uh, resilience uh, cooperation, for example. That could also include uh, more frequent uh, informal uh, discussions and in inclusion of government re representatives in the uh, <coughs> Foreign Affairs Council if and when uh, there's, a, there's alignment, of course, on, on CFSP matters, which, in which includes Sanctions, uh, by the way. Um, on, the, on the less for less um, conditionality side, the reversibility, well, there's clearly a need for more decisive measures um, with proportional sanctioning of, uh, of any serious and prolonged stagnation or backsliding 
in particular on the fundamental uh, requirements of the accession process, where negotiations could be put on hold, uh, they could be suspended, um, uh, new closed chapters could be reopened, um, funds could be withheld, of course, um, uh, for support if, if they go into the wrong pockets. Um, so they could be adjusted downwards uh, in, in more general terms. But I think, referring to your invitation to talk a little bit about a step-by-step -step approach, we've, for the past year now, uh, advocated this idea of more clearly signposting distinct stages that ought to be grafted onto the clustered approach of uh, the revised uh, methodology. So is to, well, uh, cluster in the first stage at least um, those uh, chapters of an Achillite uh, nature that could be accepted or could be uh, operationalized uh, much more quickly and uh, would lead to um, enhanced funding, uh, more access to the EU agencies, um, bodies and even institutions in an informal observer role at first, but gradually growing as levels of adherence uh, meet clearly benchmarked uh, conditions. That not, that's not the only point. I think also, and this uh, refers back to Kalinka's point on uh, the methodology, the revised methodology of uh, February 2020, which also brings the member states more on board, and which, which was, of course, a key component. Member states who are now always in, in well, the luxurious position to, to, to say go or no go, um, but would have to well, um, intervene much more closely in support, but also in the monitoring uh, on an evidence-based manner of the Commission's own um, well, progress or, or regress uh, reporting on, um, on candidates' countries' um, uh, innovations and reforms. That could be done in the pre-accession stage already. And, um, of course, it will require extra funding on the EU side, which is a, a difficult discussion in, in and of itself. Um, but at the same time, it uh, would create concrete and visible benefits for citizens, voters also, so to stimulate a more virtuous reform cycle rather than what we see in some uh, candidate countries who've been stuck uh, in, in deadlock, basically, in the enlargement process, you know, the, the type of vicious um, uh, cycles um, that, that those citizens and societies have been uh, captured in. Um, so a stage, more staged uh, process. In a way, um, there's been vocal support already for this idea, with Charles Michel in particular taken up in most concrete fashion in his speech in May uh, for the Economic and Social Committee of the European Union, um, some of these ideas. It is really still up to uh, the European Commission to, uh, to offer in more concrete form what uh, those pathways would be. And here, I think the Swedish presidency has an excellent uh, opportunity to push that debate in the, the different council working groups, the COELA, the COEB, uh, other working groups to, um, uh, to push in that uh, direction. So the methodology, in a way, can be further fit for purpose. Um, and that includes in, in Ukraine's uh, very specific uh, case, of course, uh, the, um, well, the confluence of, of reconstruction and, um, and, and further accession, which is, um, which is yeah, a, a daunting exercise, um, not just for Ukraine, but also for, for the EU to, to wrap its head around. But certainly there, there's lots of land to be tilled. We need to do it all together. That's, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, all these comments. And I would have a huge temptation for follow-up questions. And uh, I'm sure you would have uh, comments to uh, what um, the others have been saying. But uh, as promised, now I would turn to the uh, audience. And uh, uh, please uh, signal if you would have uh, questions, um, uh, comments. Yes, and please uh, state also uh, your name and, and the organization you are uh, coming from uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Nils Janssons from the Latvian Foreign Ministry. Uh, my question will go to Stephen and perhaps to Jaap if, uh, if, if possible. Um, Stephen, from, from what you 
laid out this idea of a more staged process, focusing first on the aki light areas. Is there any obstacle for conducting you know, such process, organizing such process within the accession negotiations? In other words, you know, opening the accession negotiations and then organizing them perhaps in an adjusted way, you know, with, with respect to the reconstruction needs for Ukraine, etc. But, you know, going for first for the opening of the negotiations and then organizing them in a, in a you know, adjusted manner. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. I do not see at the moment another one, so straight uh, yeah. to uh, Stephen. Um, thanks for your question. Well, obviously, e each of the Canada countries, whether they're uh, from the Western Balkans or from the Eastern neighborhood, um, find themselves at different um, moments in time or, or proximity to, uh, to the European Union and have, in some cases, different frameworks uh, to to start from the current position uh, to, you know, uh, to, to a staged process, uh, basically. So you have Serbia, but the current uh, Canada countries that are negotiating uh, already for a long time, Serbia and uh, Montenegro, and now North Macedonia and Albania, their negotiation frameworks, which would have to be adapted um, uh, to, to, to meet that stage uh, one that I referred to. Obviously, for the other uh, candidate uh, countries and, and Georgia with a European perspective, um, there are the lists of priorities which uh, have been set forward in the Commission's avis of, uh, of June, which provide the first uh, benchmark, of course, for testing uh, and before a, a General Affairs Council uh, could, could debate their readiness, their preparedness, uh, to take up uh, negotiations and thus be awarded with the candidate country status. So th th there, there are several positions, vantage points, from which each of these individual candidates, potential candidates, will have to move in order to get to, uh, to a first stage. But I think that even in the ongoing uh, negotiation, it, it ought to be possible to, to identify within the clusters a set of uh, sectors uh, which could be operationalized more quickly. Um, it would probably require a revision of the revised methodology of February uh, 2020, but as I, um, as I was trying to, to allude to, I mean, that methodology itself has been evolving uh, over time, so there's no, um, there's no philosophical um, obstacle to doing even further. Um, uh, well, uh, innovations to that uh, to that methodology, and and to apply it already on an ongoing basis. And, and the first case, of course, on reversibility is 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 there and needs to be operationalized. Uh, as far as gradual integration is concerned, there exist already all kinds of formats of a regional uh, nature. Um, you know, the the energy community, the transport community. Of a, of a bilateral nature, as, as uh, the examples that, uh, that we've uh, shown. Uh, it requires a bit of innovative thinking, uh, primarily by the European Commission, to, to restructure uh, the clustered approach from February 2020 and to graft onto it these uh, different stages. Thank you, uh, Stephen. If I, if I may add just something, yes, because yes, this, is, this is from yeah. practical yes. experience. We are undergoing now, uh, as you know, the bilateral screening. So on every meeting, with the EC services uh, during the explanatory, they asked us and Albania to report during the bilateral screening process which EU policies, EU markets, EU bodies, institutions we would like, according to what the new methodology provides, to like a phase in, step in, in order to share experience and, and provide for this. Um, staged, let's say, uh, process in, in du even during the the accession process itself. So we don't need not need to wait until full membership to accede to certain uh, policies and, and agencies. We can report it now and then, with their assistance, work towards achieving this together. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you can organise the the process as much as any way you like, but I think the delay in making progress is that reforms inevitably touch on vested interest. And that is something that requires leadership and a clear way forward to go. And that is something that is particular to 
each country that is at stake. Those interests are different in Georgia as compared to Moldova. Um, and, and that is something that each government in charge should sort out itself. We can, we can guide them, we can assist them, we can help them with the reorganization of the judiciary, the integrity of the public administration, with press freedom and everything. But those will be elements that will come back in any assessment of that country. So whichever way you organize it, you'll always come, it'll always come down to what progress has there been achieved with this particular part of the fundamentals. So you know, we should really not try to think that the system of organizing the negotiations is the problem. The issue is in the reforms itself and progress that can be made there. The reforms are absolutely fundamental, but uh, just to follow up, um, uh, at some point when uh, some reforms have been done, um, there has been uh, um, some part of a key uh, taken into um, the candidate country system. Um, do you see that there can be also uh, then, uh, well, uh, joining some EU programs, some EU policies um, as a stage uh, on the way? Um, towards yeah, I think so. Membership. I mean, that, that has been the case. They can join Erasmus, they can join Horizon. So that, that, is, that is part of being a candidate country or a country with, with perspective of membership. That is already the case. And um, I would uh, now look for the next question. Yes, please. And uh, yes. Thank you very much uh, for an extremely thought-provoking uh, panel. Uh, and uh, my name is Petr Markovic, I'm the ambassador of Montenegro to the EU. Um, and Montenegro is a front runner in the accession process. So for us, the, the promise of what the revised methodology calls accelerated integration, a uh, fuzzy term, which is better translated as um, staged integration or phasing into EU membership is extremely important. Uh, but I would also, which is just a comment, advise against revising the recently revised <laughs> accession <laughs> methodology because we, we saw that it, it. it was an excuse for those re less, um, those more reluctant member states to stall the process for two, three years until it was fleshed out. Um, and all the necessary elements for a phased integration are already there. It, we don't on, we only have the mention of reversibility of the process, but also uh, uh, of accelerated integration, which is actually the possibility to, uh, to become member of EU programs and frameworks ahead of full membership. Well, I just wanted to, to add that point of caution to the debate. Thank you. Uh, excellent to have your comment from Montenegro, which indeed is, uh, is well advanced already in, in the negotiations. Thank you. Uh, there was a question uh, or comment from uh, uh, Karin. Yes. Hello. I'm Karin Mandi from the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, referring a little bit to what Ambassador Fredrik, Fredriks was saying earlier, I would have a question or I would like to hear your comments from either side on the... Mm, ambiguity that we always have, not always, that we mostly have in, in decisions uh, on uh, opening uh, negotiations or, or, or also on the criteria for, for becoming a candidate or for uh, going to the next step. I think this is within the nature of, of EU decisions. You need to find a compromise, compromise and in order to get everybody on board you need to have a certain ambiguity. But this also seems to be the, the certain ambiguity on how these, for instance, the seven steps for Ukraine or, or, or uh, the number of issues for Northern Macedonia, uh, how these are interpreted by, first of all, the country itself and uh, by the EU member states. This seems to be creating some kind of uncertainty for the candidates or, or potential candidates themselves. And, and become somehow a matter of trust towards the EU. So I was wondering what could be the ways from both sides to, to do something about this grey zone so this doesn't 
uh, create the perception of that we can't really trust the process, that there is something that we don't know, mm -hmm. uh, and which in turn, as we can hear from North Macedonia, has meant that uh, the support to the EU enlargement process is not as strong maybe as, it's, uh, as it was uh, some time ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And credibility and trust are keywords that have uh, been mentioned and, uh, and really essential. Would you like to comment, please? Yeah, I think happened? one of the issues is that maybe in the, in the whole process, we do not focus as much on achievements as on failures. And therefore, if we, if in the Commission reports, it is, well, it is usually pointed out, but not in the press and in communication, it is pointed out where progress is being made we do this whole thing in a much more positive mindset. But in the press, usually in a commission report, it is singled out where uh, we do not make enough progress because that in the end is deciding for moving to a next stage or not. I think in that sense, communication is vital. Would you like to comment as well? Yeah. Yes. Well. Maybe just briefly, I, I don't want to hijack this panel, which has so far tended to be of a regional nature, but I, I do think that North Macedonia is case in the point in this regard. Um, I remember us back in 2018, uh, there was a referendum on the name, uh, of the ch constitutional change of the name, and we had everybody come to, to Skopje, so there was the whole lineup of high-level politicians from the European Union, from EU member states, from the US, you name it, you know, from Mer Merkel to, to Macron, uh, inciting uh, the population um, to, to vote in favor of the constitutional, of the change of the, of the name at the referendum, um, with the promise that this will be the final thing that would be requested of North Macedonia in its, after, you know, to stop this long wait in the waiting room and finally start, become NATO member and uh, start uh, accession negotiations. Uh, the name was changed, uh, NATO membership was delivered, accession did not start. And then the first thing uh, President Vucic said after the first Bulgarian veto, he said, he said, why should I strike a deal with Kosovo? Look what they did to North Macedonia. They gave everything that they could have given. They gave you know, uh, their name, their dignity. Now they're asking for their identity. They will deliver on that, but then the European Union will not will deliver. Of course, I do not agree with Vucic on the, the way he handles uh, these this bilateral issues. But you should be aware when discussing ambiguity, because that was uh, the, 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 the word that you, that you raised. There is no ambiguity on what is expected of candidate countries to deliver. There is a sit, certain, very clear set of criteria of what is expected from us. Some deliver, other window dress, some sugar coat, but that is a whole different process. The problem is that there is a whole discussion in our region on the ambiguity on the part of the European Union when we deliver. And that is what happens, why the, the credibility uh, stumbled uh, so much. And then this is not... It's only Albania that has a very high um, support, public support for, for uh, the EU. But then Bosnia, Serbia, North Macedonia, and Kosovo, of course, is very on the positive side. Uh, but all the others, uh, the, the, the numbers have been falling sharply over the past years because of this, you know, different messages that, that we get. And then, by the same token, there is no enthusiasm and strength in the society to deliver on the necessary reforms. So this is a double-ending sort of a way which 
will be detrimental for both the countries of the region and the European Union and for the countries of the Eastern Partnership tomorrow if we don't devise a strategy in partnership and in open discussion of, yes, this is expected of you, and we will deliver once, once, you, once you deliver. Communication remains crucial. Well, time is mercilessly uh, running, and uh, we have now uh, time for only short concluding uh, remarks uh, before uh, we have to break for lunch. Uh, so I would like you to uh, please be very concise in these remarks, uh, and, um, uh, and I would like to, uh, to start uh, with uh, perhaps, again, uh, Kalinka. Um, and, and then uh, just coming, coming this way. Just briefly, I, I think I, I abused your time. Um, what I, I will uh, solicit and, and um, champion is that we finally make this a partnership process, a very open and honest and merit-based, uh, where, as I said previously, uh, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, so when there is an advancement on the, on the reform agenda, this is recognized with you know, accelerated integration, staged integration, phasing in. Uh, when there is backsliding, that this should be recognized because if it's not recognized and, and, and sanctioned as such, then it backfires in our own societies and it undermines uh, the, the enthusiasm for the EU. So let's make this process uh, a, a true partnership because I really believe that we are stronger together. Yep. I would just say, do not doubt the sincerity of the EU and the member states in this process. It's difficult, it's lengthy, it touches on, on, on important issues and vested interest, but we are in this sincerely with the intention of getting these countries on board. Here, here. Um, Lyubov? Uh, thank you. I would like to finish with two issues. Uh, first one, I, just, I would like just to repeat the words that were expressed by the experts. Ukraine should deliver uh, practical results in fundamental sectors, sector, especially with, with uh, uh, judicial reform and uh, anti-corruption reform and use it at, as a real chance to become a EU membership and to inspire Western Balkans that it is not a fairy tale, I mean membership perspective, that it is a real politics. And the last issue, it is, it is not connected uh, to the EU enlargement, but it is connected to to EU resilience. Several months ago, I had a meeting with an expert in telecommunication services, and she <clears throat> shared with me such a story that Luba, in case we adopt all the EU legislation in the sector of telecommunication services, we will not manage to be such resilient as we are now. So I think it is a momentum also for the EU to think about the aki. It is regulated so much. She just made an example that if to, because she is a sectoral expert, that if to go in line with all the procedures, you will need weeks and months to restore infrastructure, while Ukraine is doing this in one day, in two days. So I think that also EU need to think not about the revision of enlargement policy, but EU also need to think about resilience. And EU key should also be changed, uh, taken into consideration this factor. It's my personal point of view. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I endorse that point. It's a, it's a very good one. Um, th there's a risk, of course, of misunderstanding the importance of procedure. Um, because it might, you know, be eclipsed by, by greater momentous geopolitical um, uh, developments. But if the procedure is not changed, the EU will not be able to meet its geopolitical interest, I think. And this is 
why I think a revision of the revised methodology is necessary. It has introduced some changes. Uh, this is to your point, uh, Ambassador. It has introduced some changes, the clustered approach, which ideally would lead, you know, uh, as far as the Commission is concerned, to an opening and closing of those negotiations per cluster in a year's time. I would have to see that. Which would bring the Member States on board, in support and in monitoring on the side of the European Commission. We'll see about that. Um, which would um, lead to a more evidence-based um, monitoring as well, rather than merely political. We'll have to see about that. But which does not break the many veto opportunities that individual member states have in the process. And this is the Achilles heel. And this is why I think the revised methodology needs to be further revised. It's easy for Montenegro, which is currently a member, a front runner, to say that. It is a country of 620,000 people. There are geopolitical interests at stake in a country that is 70 times bigger uh, than that. Um, there are countries in the Western Balkans, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, which are trapped basically for other reasons, constitutional in nature, relating all the way back to UN Security Council resolution um, of the Dayton Agreement, as far as Bosnia are concerned, which will not be helped and which will remain trapped in their deadlock if gradual integration is not mobilized sincerely. And if the veto, individual veto powers for, uh, for on the EU side are not diminished in, uh, in numbers. So I think there is absolutely a clear geopolitical interest to, uh, to change um, the, uh, the methodology. And um, there I think you know, the, the staged process uh, which, we've, uh, which we've advocated for could be introduced on the go by the European Commission. Um, you know, the Commission could tweak basically it's clustered approach and, uh, and structure those conditions much more visibly so as to create milestones on the way um, which effectively rob both uh, well, the, the member states in particular from any excuses in granting the type of socioeconomic and political benefits that are needed in order to close the gap more quickly. I see uh, already many follow-up discussions taking place during the, the lunch break. I, I thank you all so much for uh, this, uh, uh, what I have been uh, witnessing as, as a rich discussion full of different, different points. And, and each, the story of each of our countries is so unique. And the story of our uh, EU accession is unique. And um, of course, the challenges are often also um, common and uh, something that we can um, more broadly uh, broadly see. But uh, uh, but uh, I very much um, value the fact that we have been uh, having this EU enlargement panel today in the uh, circumstances of the new paradigm of uh, having uh, an enlarged circle of candidate countries together with Ukraine uh, uh, representative. Uh, on the uh, panel, and of course, uh, Western Balkans uh, also uh, present in the panel. Uh, thank you, um, because also uh, the uh, movement of all Western Balkans countries uh, towards the EU, I hope, has been really uh, given a new push with this uh, new historic step that we have taken together this year. And thank you, Yap, for providing the. Uh, founding member state perspective, uh, and, uh, and uh, Stephen for uh, uh, all the comments on, um, uh, on different aspects of the enlargement process and not uh, the least the, uh, the idea of the staged uh, enlargement uh, possibilities. So thank you all very much for uh, this discussion and uh, uh, thank you also to the audience uh, for the patience and uh, for uh, your uh, taking part of the discussion, and uh, I was also tasked to say that lunch is uh, being served uh, downstairs, so and there will be a buffet lunch uh, downstairs. I hope you will all find your way uh, to this, but I hope an applause to uh, the speakers on the panel uh, is also... Thank you.
light is a bit. Yes, strong, where I find like a TV, st you know, TV yeah, yeah, studio. Yeah, it looks like a live show on Velvet Canal. <laughs> 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 So, welcome back. At least the majority of the, of, of the people seem seem to be back, <laughs> and I'm very happy to start our next panel, which is um, somewhat pro provocatively titled "Is Eastern Partnership Dead?" Um, well, um, time flies. Extremely well. Uh, so much has happened over the last year, but actually it was only a year ago that the new sites were set for the Eastern Partnership uh, policy. Everything seemed to be fine, and then the um, Russian invasion in Ukraine in February. Then Ukraine and Moldova became candidate countries. Uh, Georgia got the European perspective, and Suddenly, people are asking, well, um, how about the Eastern Partnership uh, in this uh, new geopolitical reality? And, um, well, there have been those I have seen with my eyes, people who have declared it dead um, in some countries represented here, well, including my own as well. Um, at the same time, um, well, when organizing the conference, the eighth conference on the Eastern Partnership, well, we had our doubts as well. If we just call it another Eastern Partnership Conference, would people show up? So uh, we decided to add enlargement to the title as well. Um, so you have shown up, um, which is already a good thing. <laughs> but still, the Eastern Partnership, is it dead? Or in the way of the parrot in, in Monty Python, uh, is it just resting? Or is it adjustable? to the new circumstances, to the new realities, and actually, is it useful? Um, will it thrive in the new circumstances? And do we need to change it? If yes, then how? Addressing this question, we have a prominent panel. Um, I think it's a, it's a perfect mix. We have Brussels, we have a, a member state, we have... Um, a, an Eastern Partnership country, and we have um, a view perhaps more neutral from the academia. So um, let's get it started. First of all, introducing uh, the people. Professor Katarina Volchuk is uh, a professor of politics at the Center for Russian, European, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Birmingham, and an associate fellow at Chatham House with the Russia and Eurasia program. She has published ex um, extensively on Eastern Europe, uh, EU's Eastern policy in Russia, European integration, and as I've noticed, especially the topic Ukraine and Europe, Europe and Ukraine has been close to your heart for, for many, many years, and um, well, what is close to my heart, uh, I'm happy to see that you have been teaching at my own alma mater, the College of Europe in Natolin uh, as well. Uh, then Dirk Schubel, uh, the European unions, or as you actually like to correct people, the European External Action Services um, Special Envoy for Eastern Partnership since October, so uh, freshly in this office. And prior to this um, appointment, uh, Dirk was EU's head of delegation to Belarus. Also, um, he's been EU ambassador in the Republic of Moldova and has also worked in the EU delegation to Ukraine. But um, more generally, uh, Dirk has been dealing with the Eastern Partnership countries and Russia for many, many years and has a long experience in the region. Uh, Christina Johansson is the Swedish Eastern Partnership ambassador, also rather new to the job. And before that, um, you were in Minsk as well as uh, Swedish ambassador. And uh, you have also been posted to Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, Brussels, uh, well, one of the uh, co-est alumni uh, in our midst. Um, and happy to welcome you in Tallinn a bit as from a time capsule as your last visit to Tallinn took place in 1989. So uh, as we always um, say, well, we, we hope it's changed a bit. <laughs> and finally, 
Yeojian Karas, I hope I, I got it right, um, is the director of, of the European Integration Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in the Republic of Moldova. And uh, he served as Moldova's ambassador to the European Union and to the United States of America, which is um, well, uh, a really distinguished career. I was trying to um, enumerate Estonian diplomats who have done uh, both jobs, and uh, I, uh, well, I had to stop the count at one, so uh, it is uh, <laughs> rare indeed. Um, but well, getting to Eastern Partnership and its uh, perspectives. Dirk, you have just started. The position has been just created at the very moment when we are asking those questions. So this means that your employer must have you know, some certainty about the, the future of the policy. So how do you see it? Uh, how do you see your mission at this position? And how do you see the future of Eastern Partnership? I should hope so, dear Gerd. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, conference. Uh, for me, it's not since 89 that I have been the last time in Tallinn, but it's also, I think, a good 20 years or something like this that I've been here. So very happy to be back in, in beautiful, beautiful Tallinn. Indeed, I've been dealing uh, with this part of the world for all too long, I should almost say. Um, but I have uh, had the pleasure to be at the origins of the Eastern Partnership already, so I could follow basically developments even from the European neighborhood policy uh, starting uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, and I would uh, there first of all say that uh, the Eastern Partnership has helped uh, all countries uh, in, in many ways, all six Eastern Partnership countries in, uh, in many ways. And I would dare say that the front runners, if we may still call them like this, Ukraine, uh, Moldova and Georgia, would not be where they are now and would probably not have gotten this, uh, this uh, accession perspective and two candidate uh, country statuses uh, if, uh, if it hadn't been for the Eastern Partnership. I think we have uh, helped them uh, through the Eastern Partnership to get prepared for, for that very, very moment. But of course, uh, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the future uh, of the Eastern Partnership. And I, first of all, I, I think we, we, we all know that uh, we can make many plans right now, many uh, new uh, um, strategy, developed strategies and, and tactics, tactical plans, what we should do with the Eastern Partnership. But in the end, everything will depend on the outcome of the war in Ukraine. Uh, this is, uh, I think, what we, what we all do know. So um, uh, it is under these premises that we discuss, uh, uh, obviously, we should do our utmost and the Eastern Partnership should also do uh, its utmost, whatever is possible, to help Ukraine, as we have heard from the previous speakers, to, to, to gain this, uh, uh, this uh, heroic battle that they are, that they are leading. Um, <clears throat> so there has been, uh, overall, I think, despite of the war, there has been a positive dynamic uh, between the EU and, uh, and, and, uh, and all countries, perhaps except for Belarus, I come to that in a minute. Uh, following the historic decisions that we have seen in, uh, in June uh, by the European Council, indeed we have uh, now three uh, countries with an accession perspective and uh, two of them candidate countries. Uh, we, are also, uh, we also have become very active as European Union and we had the pleasure just to hear that from our counterparts. We got active uh, in the Southern Caucasus, uh, in particular with regard to the conflict uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan on Nagorno-Karabakh. And um, uh, our increased activity, which I interpret also as a part of the geo more geopolitical positioning of the European Union, uh, has been very much appreciated by both sides, by both Armenia and by Azerbaijan. Uh, as you know, we have uh, prepared a mission, EUM Cup there, uh, which uh, is seen very positively. And of course, the active uh, role of uh, President uh, Michel, uh, my boss, the high representative, and also our EU special representative, who is Estonian, Toivo Kla, has been, uh, has been widely raised. So um, um, I think that is also a part of, uh, of a more active uh, role, which I would also define under the Eastern Partnership in a way. Um, um, Belarus, uh, we continue our support, of course, for, for the Belarusian people. And for us, uh, Belarus remains a part of the Eastern Partnership. Um, but of course, at this moment, not with the leadership, with the government, uh, of those who believe to be the government, but with the uh, civil society, with the democratic forces uh, that will, of course, continue. Uh, so what do, uh, what do we in Europe think about the Eastern Partnership? Um, if we may believe the recent uh, official meetings that we have held, namely first the so-called Coest Capitals uh, meeting, meaning a, uh, a meeting of the working group, but of the 
responsibles in our European capitals for the, uh, for the area, uh, that there was such a meeting in September, and we had also a senior officials meeting per, per video conference, which was my first uh, um, activity, basically, in, in my new job um, in, in, in October. And there we, we didn't hear any criticism, uh, basically, from any of the member states, nor from the, uh, from the um, Eastern Partnership countries who were, who were uh, speaking. Uh, so we do believe that there is a strong mandate that we should continue with the Eastern Partnership but obviously it cannot go on with business as usual. That I think we all, we all know. So um, it is, uh, we believe that is in particular also in these difficult times, it's good to have some anchor uh, uh, that, could, uh, that can help everyone. And we believe that the Eastern Partnership can be such, a, such an anchor. Uh, it was already mentioned by the minister this morning, um, uh, the Estonian foreign minister, that, uh, uh, that the Eastern Partnership should in no way uh, influence uh, on the enlargement process of those who want to uh, jo uh, join the European Union. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, on the contrary, the Eastern Partnership has, has to be more developed into a tool which is helping uh, those countries on their way uh, to, the, to the European Union, uh, on their way to start negotiations. Um, uh, so that, uh, I think, is, is, uh, will be the new crucial task for the Eastern Partnership in the future for these three. And for the others, we should develop a very tailor-made approach um, and maybe also uh, uh, um, listen to those uh, countries, what they want. Uh, we were just in Armenia, as I said, and in Armenia there was a, a broad support for the Eastern Partnership because they believe that this is an ideal way to help in the implementation of our ambitious agreement uh, that we have uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Armenia. And even Azerbaijan said, uh, of course, uh, in certain areas, uh, Azerbaijan is uh, very much willing and ready to continue uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Eastern Partnership uh, um, policy with us. Um, and of course, uh, we used also our slogan, uh, recovery, resilience and reform. And I think these recovery, resilience and reform have never been so important as today, in particular resilience, of course, as it was also mentioned in, in, in previous panels. Uh, which are the areas that I think we should in particular support? Um, security, security, security. I think this is number one, two and three in, in terms of priority in the given circumstances. Energy, I think you, we see all what is happening uh, in Ukraine these days and also elsewhere in our member states. Um, uh, so energy supplies and energy security. Uh, Macroeconomic stability, I think in all of this situation is, uh, will also be of utmost importance. And in general terms, of course, to do everything that strengthens the independence of the Eastern Partnership countries as not only, uh, this, this is not only a problem in Ukraine. Uh, we both have served in, uh, in Belarus, uh, so this is a problem also for, for this country. Unfortunately, the leadership doesn't do much to, uh, to support the independence, just the opposite. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, the other countries. Moldova, in, uh, in, uh, Eugene surely will, will raise this, uh, is uh, indirectly very much affected by the Ukraine war as well. Uh, we have also the uh, um, European the Eastern Partnership Investment and Economic Plan that can also contribute financially to our efforts. So a maximum 2.3 billion euros will be made available in the next five years, which we hope can be used also uh, exactly for, the, for strengthening the resilience of the, of the partner countries. Um, Complementarity, I mentioned already. Yes, maybe we have to do away with, with these many meetings. There have been up to more than 100 meetings before COVID that we held in all kinds of flagship initiatives and, uh, and platforms. I think we have to a little bit uh, become less bureaucratic in this context and to hold meetings where they are needed and not just to tick the box and we have to have a, prepare the next uh, flagship meeting on XYZ uh, that we should, uh, we should uh, probably do, do, do away with. Um, then um, differentiation, I mentioned already, I think that it will be the, the crucial factor. We have mentioned it many, 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 for many years already, but I think we should really do it. Uh, I think we should also differentiate in the meetings. If there's, if there's only two out of six countries uh, who are interested in a meeting on environment, then let's have a meeting with these two. Um, it doesn't have to be always six. If not all three um, front-runner countries want to, uh, want to have a meeting on a certain topic, let's do it with uh, one or two only. Uh, and the same goes for the, for the other countries. I think we should become much more flexible on this. We should also uh, strengthen, uh, you know, it was very good this morning that we have, uh, had colleagues from Macedonia and I uh, know from North Macedonia and we have also the, the EU ambassador to 
or the ambassador to, uh, of Montenegro to the EU here. Uh, so I think that's an excellent mix, and I think we should use this also more in the future. Moldova, by the way, is the only country that has, uh, is, is integrated already in some of the Southeast European structures, the only Eastern Partnership country. So we should use maybe also this, and we should uh, hold joint meetings to exchange uh, you know, experience simply um, that the Western Balkan countries have made with the enlargement process so far. Not all went smooth, we all know this, but I'm sure there are also some things which are good and which uh, the, uh, the three can, can learn from, uh, from, 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 from those countries. At the same time, I think maybe also a look to the east might help. Central Asia, we just had a very, uh, um, uh, two very important meetings with Central Asia, Central Asian Ministerial, and uh, also a, a connectivity meeting, um, um, which uh, has uh, been assessed as very positive. So I think also in given areas, energy jumps to one's mind, of course, immediately, but maybe also climate change, environment, uh, economy, transport, uh, to do some meetings jointly with some uh, Central Asian countries might also be good to, to, uh, to exchange experience and to see how we can uh, put all our uh, plans that we have uh, in terms of connectivity better into, into practice. Um, so, uh, Belarus, as I said, we stay, of course, with Belarus uh, in touch within the framework of the Eastern Partnership. It, uh, in fact, we have an idea to have regular meetings with the democratic forces um, uh, twice per year. That is the idea to meet uh, and to discuss with them on all different areas of interest, again, in a flexible way. Uh, we have had one uh, sort of this kind of meeting in the margins of the last Eastern Partnership Summit in December in Brussels, and something like this is also in our minds that we want to continue, so Belarus remains an integral part of this Eastern Partnership policy. Uh, the next steps are we have um, uh, uh, a ministerial meeting um, uh, in, the fr in, in the margins of the next Foreign Affairs Council in December. Uh, it will be a breakfast. It's now public, and, uh, and uh, so I can, I can mention it, where we will discuss the future of the Eastern Partnership. Um, 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 so that, I think, will be a very, uh, very important uh, uh, moment. Um, as I said, uh, I think it is good to make some plans uh, and, to, and to make plans for a reloaded Eastern Partnership, um, uh, but obviously uh, a lot will depend on, uh, on what is happening in, uh, in Ukraine, and we very much hope that uh, this will even give a, a bigger impetus to the outcome of the, of the war, that we can uh, use the Eastern Partnership in an even better way to bring those countries where they belong to, uh, those who want, uh, namely to the European Union. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, well, moving to closer to us, uh, to Stockholm, Christina. Well, Sweden is the next presidency of the European Union. Sweden was um, at the very birth of the Eastern Partnership and has always been very active. How do you see it evolving, the, the policy, over the next years? Yes, thank you, uh, Gert, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important meeting. You referred to 2009 when it all started. And I remember at the time I was posted to Moscow and we spent numerous occasions trying to inform the Russian side about this new initiative, but they showed no interest at all. They even, uh, at last, they just told us that leave us alone, we are not interested in this because it's not for us. Then things, of course, changes, changed, and, uh, and their uh, relation to, uh, to the partnership uh, changed. Yes, I think uh, Dirk has already covered a lot of topics, I mean, on the, on the, on the status of, uh, of uh, the partnership and uh, the priorities. I think we have now an, a unique, a unique uh, opportunity when we have a consensus among the EU 27, the 27 member states, that we will preserve the format. Uh, also very important that we have the EU institutions on board, and more importantly, we have the partner countries on board, uh, the five partner countries on board as well. Of course, every partner country will uh, always underline that they prioritize their uh, bilateral relations to the EU, but as Dirk already said, also with more flexibility within the partnership, we can gather smaller groups, we can gather those countries and also those member states being uh, invested in different topics uh, in order to find a, a, a way uh, forward. Uh, so I think the, the provoking title is the Eastern Partnership dead. I think it is not. And also your minister actually this morning said that it is not. So, so that is also very good to, to, see, uh, to see the support. But 
Again, to start with the obvious, uh, I mean, Russia's invasion of Ukraine overthrew uh, the security order and, and the world can never go back to what it was before the 24th of February. And also it put the partnership in a completely different uh, situation. Many of the initiatives and areas and topics which were discussed before February are maybe today not as relevant as they used to be. They may well come back, but today, of course, it's about security, resilience, and a lot of other more, um, um, so to say, well, security-related uh, um, issues. Uh, and it's also clear that while we don't have the exact outcome of the war, it is also very difficult to predict the future of the Eastern Partnership. It's also very difficult to predict the role and the political and economical relations that we will have in the region for years uh, to come. And it is as well difficult to predict what role the European Union will play in the region. But again, the Eastern Partnership also probably complemented with other, with other formats, can at least give us the architecture and the structure uh, in the relations with, with, with five, uh, five countries out of six at the moment uh, to the east of the, um, uh, to the, um, uh, to the Union. Um, I agree as well that, this, uh, that the Eastern Partnership uh, has been uh, a success. I very much liked your comment yesterday when you said it was a success uh, yeah, because it gave the possibility to achieve what was achievable. And I think that is a very uh, uh, to the point uh, comment and I'm sure you will develop uh, uh, those thoughts more in your presentation. But uh, it is also important I think to remember that before 2009 uh, we didn't have much of a structure for uh, forging constructive and forward-looking relations with the countries to the east, and, and uh, the Eastern Partnership became that, uh, that architecture needed to take many, many uh, important topics ahead, and also, of course, uh, building uh, sustainable relations uh, between, between the peoples in our, in our uh, countries. So today we are engaging, uh, including here in Tallinn today, in, in discussions on the future of the Eastern Par Partnership because of the fact that the Eastern Partnership is, is not uh, dead. But we need to upgrade it and we are in dire need of good ideas. But um, just a couple of words about the incoming presidency of, of, of Sweden in the European Union. Uh, the priorities of the presidency will be presented by the Prime Minister to Parliament mid-December, so I will not forego, of course, that um, presentation, but it is already clear that uh, the biggest focus for the Swedish presidency is the support to Ukraine in every possible uh, way. Um, humanitarian support, military support, economically, politically, any, any way. And uh, another, of course, uh, connected priority is going to be handle the consequences on the war and Russia. But also, Eastern Partnership has been defined uh, preliminarily, uh, I should say, as one of the uh, priorities because of the fact that the Eastern Partnership still provides for structure, finances, uh, projects, topics that are useful both to the European Union and to uh, the partner uh, countries. So in our view, it is important not to rush things, uh, keep existing working structures of the partnership, uh, while we will be engaging uh, internally uh, in discussions on the future and the content, of course we need to have a more resilient partnership and we have to be more supportive when it comes to the resilience of uh, the partner countries. And I'm sure we will see several initiatives uh, on, this, uh, uh, on these topics. Let me finishing by um, uh, putting forward the values. I think it is extremely important now when we are talking about a new partnership with more of security and resilience that we do not forget about values, values and norms and values. We all know that it was the values uh, who uh, constituted the main attraction for many, uh, for many uh, partner countries uh, of the European Union. Uh, it was the values of the European Union who attracted the partner countries, and we should not uh, forget about that. 
uh, we have a very uh, important uh, actor, a watchdog, you can call them, within our system. That's the European uh, Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. A very good, uh, ver very good actor, which um, uh, make um, they make uh, annual reports on. On, uh, on human rights and democracy and other important uh, areas uh, within uh, uh, within the partner countries, and uh, uh, I am sure that we will be working more closely also uh, with them. So summoning up, no, it's not dead. Let's keep it. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's don't rush and. Uh, uh, of course, I would like to take the opportunity to also thank the Czech Presidency for having an extensive calendar with a lot of Eastern Partnership related uh, um, events, uh, very useful. I'm not sure that we will have uh, so many events as you did, but we will be very happy to pick up from where you leave it uh, on the 31st of December and looking forward to more discussions with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank you for the optimism. Eugen, it seemed that um, the Republic of Moldova was rather happy with the existing Eastern Partnership. Uh, now that Moldova has become a candidate country, what well, has this diminished your happiness and increased sort of unhappiness, or are you still happy, or how do you see the, the future of the policy? Yeah, we are happy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We are happy, uh, but uh, but uh, thank you, thank you to the organizers for uh, for making this possible. My participation and uh, it's really good to be back in Tallinn and to reconnect with the, with friends of Moldova, with friends of Eastern Partnership, uh, Dirk, Ingrid, uh, were in Kishinev serving. Uh, but, but many, of course, many Estonian and European uh, diplomats uh, working uh, both in Moldova but also in Brussels, elsewhere. We do feel your support and we are very much appreciative for, for what, uh, what has uh, been happening uh, lately uh, within the Eastern Partnership. And uh, <clears throat> indeed, the, 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 the question is provocative, uh, but... Uh, we already know the answer, I think, uh, uh, starting from this morning. Everybody, everybody agrees that the Eastern Partnership uh, is alive and, um, and uh, is important. And uh, uh, I would like uh, in my presentation exactly to, to say how we see it uh, uh, and to, to from, from the, the, the umbrella of the Eastern Partnership, including multilateral dimension, and then to zoom in uh, into the bilateral dimension and, and tell you how, where we stand now with the, the accession um, uh, uh, phase. Uh, but uh, so uh, Moldova has been, has been supportive uh, and taking advantage indeed of this policy uh, for, uh, for these uh, 13 years. Uh, this has been an important uh, um, um, venue and instrument for us. And uh, I, I totally agree with Dirk that Moldova and others wouldn't be here if it, it were not for the, for the Eastern Partnership. Uh, it, we have to, to, be, uh, to be fair and to recognize that uh, we, uh, Eastern Partnership, has played a very important role in, in our rapprochement with the, with the European Union and um, uh, between each other and, and also paving the way uh, for, for our accession uh, prospects. So during, exactly during uh, these uh, years, we have uh, signed and uh, are implementing the association agreement. We have a visa free uh, with uh, Schengen area um, uh, benefiting uh, uh, all, all the population. And of course, uh, the economy recovery plan is in place. Uh, many other platforms that, <clears throat> that we are exploring and we are dealing with. So um, uh, uh, again, uh, we, are, uh, we recognize the benefits, but we also uh, uh, look into how this will evolve because uh, we do understand that uh, uh, the enlargement policy and the Eastern uh, na European neighborhood policies, these are two different policies. 
uh, they are covered by uh, the financial instruments which, uh, which has a time lapse, so to say, till uh, 2027. So I think uh, what, what we are thinking, what Brussels is, is thinking, of course, it's how, how we operate till 27 and what happens afterwards. So uh, this is uh, all valid questions, and, uh, and I think uh, in, in the meantime, we as Moldova remain very much open to all uh, venues, all the possibilities that Eastern Partnership is offering uh, to all of us uh, and to, to our... And, and indeed, I, I cannot agree more that it should help us to, to walk the way to, to, to accession. Uh, in the meantime, again, uh, I think uh, uh, Christina just mentioned uh, some of the platforms that uh, uh, are in the, in the Eastern Partnership, and I think uh, we, uh, we know that we used to have, uh, and it was in 2021 when we had the, the last summit. So one question mark, uh, for us, for, for ourselves, is uh, how, how do we do about summits? So Dirk mentioned about ministerial uh, in, in December. So uh, there are also other, other venues such as uh, Civil Society Forum, uh, but uh, Corlip, Euronest. Uh, so we, we, will, we have time. Uh, but, but I think uh, we, we better start uh, also reflecting on, on, uh, on these issues as we, as we go on. Now, um, if you would allow me uh, to focus a bit on the bilateral track, so to say, on what Moldova is doing on, on its accession. Of course, uh, Gert, coming back to, to your initial question about happiness. Of course, we are very happy with this, uh, with this development and the decision of June. Um, and, uh, uh, and we are happy, but, but we, of course, we have a great sense of responsibility also. And uh, we do understand that uh, we shouldn't let down our own uh, society but also our partners. So we should deliver for our own people, but also for, uh, to, 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 to make sure that the expectations <clears throat> and the credits and the, uh, the, the, the strong uh, courage uh, that we have from, from, from EU side uh, inspired to us. So, so I think we, we shouldn't let uh, anyone down. Uh, so we take it very seriously. Uh, after the, the, after the, uh, the Commission opinion, of course, we uh, drafted our own uh, plan of action to target these nine uh, conditions. And our calendar is to fulfill uh, um, and to have a, a good track record on the implementation of these nine uh, conditions by uh, summer next year. Uh, the calculation is that uh, uh, when the uh, Commission uh, re uh, draws uh, its report for, uh, uh, for eventually autumn, October uh, uh, next, uh, next year, as we know on, uh, for the enlargement package, so, so that the Commission can take into account this, uh, this report and uh, the, the, our track record, so to say. So um, uh, we have uh, envisaged uh, about uh, 60 actions that would, uh, would allow us to reach these objectives. Um, it's not a ticking the box exercise, it's for real, it's uh, working hard. Uh, there is a mechanism in place. There is a National Commission for European Integration. There is a Governmental Commission for European Integration. They meet regularly, institutions report. So reforms are taking place. There is certain speed. Uh, we, we want to make sure that there is no delay. And we do hear uh, what colleagues tell us from member states, that it's both the 
approval of the reforms, but also the implementation of these uh, packages. So we, we, we do our homework, uh, um, uh, I think, in, in, a, in, a, in a very serious manner. And we should be able to, to report uh, from time to time. We already produced a first uh, report uh, mid-October, uh, and we, we shared it with the Commission services and member states. So we, our plan is to, to produce such reports as we advance. And as I said, um, uh, it's altogether 60 actions, 35 till the, the end of the, of the year, and we, we have done half of, from this 35. So it's, uh, we, 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 we are progressing uh, pretty well, I think, uh, on, uh, on the implementation of this uh, action plan. Um, in the meantime, of course, we will, uh, we will be implementing uh, the association agreement and uh, the association agenda. We have a new association agenda 2021-2027, which was just uh, in August uh, approved. So this all stays in place, and uh, we see it uh, as very... Uh, you know, going uh, in parallel tracks for the same uh, aim, target uh, of, of rapprochement, and uh, uh, kicking off the accession talks at some point. Uh, the, the, the fact that I mentioned this calendar of uh, us uh, doing homework on nine-step uh, action plan by summer uh, is... Uh, of course, uh, connected to the to the next uh, commission report uh, uh, on enlargement, so enlargement package report, and then of course we would be we would be counting on uh, on the council to look uh, positively. I hope uh, into into a, I hope positive report of the of the commission. Um, Aside, of course, from the association agreement agenda and the nine-step uh, nine, uh, nine action plan, we, we, we follow, of course, uh, all the, the patterns that were in place uh, till, uh, till we got this uh, excellent historic uh, decision by the Council. There is, uh, of course, a boost and an interest for, for uh, understandable reasons. The war in Ukraine affected uh, everyone, but I think Moldova is uh, mostly vulnerable uh, from, from, uh, from, the, from the region. Uh, you know the figures on the refugees, uh, on, the, on the impact on the trade, on the economy, energy. Energy is, 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 uh, is, I think, now the, the biggest challenge for, for Moldova. We have to, to save electricity and gas consumption. This is what we are doing, but also to look, uh, of course, for new, for new uh, markets and for new opportunities. Maybe we will talk about it later on during the, the Q&A. Um, but for, 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 un, uh, reason, for, for understandable reasons, so security and defense is very, very prominent on our bilateral agenda with the EU, and uh, we, we are happy to have this high-level dialogue on, on defense and on security. Plus, we have uh, the, the, the EPF, uh, European uh, Peace Facility, and, uh, which is a, a, another important instrument. We, we are getting support, and we count on support. So it's, it's about the security uh, uh, of, of, uh, of Moldova and of the region, because we do see uh, missiles uh, running into our space, airspace. Uh, we do see missile landing in our, uh, Russian missile landing on our territory. So this is, this is clearly, uh, uh, clearly a concern, a huge concern for our security and, and the defense needs to be, to be boosted. So we are talking to all partners, but EU is, uh, is a, 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 a very important partner to, to talk to, uh, including on, on security and defense area. Trade-wise, we continue, uh, <clears throat> we continue our work on DCFTA. Somebody mentioned in, in the first half of the day 
Moldova is a clear uh, winner of this DCFTA. More than two-thirds of our exports go to EU market. Uh, Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova exports uh, 50 or so percent of trade to EU market. So, uh, and uh, DCFTA is, uh, was a, a game changer for us uh, and is uh, an important uh, uh, part of the association agreement. Of course, we want to, to join new, we, now we are at the phase of joining new programs, single market program, fiscalis, customs, and, uh, uh, and important work is being undertaken for joining uh, SEPA, and I hope this will be a good track record. I mentioned energy, and I, I, uh, I think we are now better prepared than a year ago. Uh, challenging, still challenging times, but we are part of the NSOE. We, we can receive now electricity from Romania, uh, as well as gas from Romania through, through this interconnector, which was not the case uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, a year ago, for instance. So there are, there are and, and I, I should, I should uh, uh, certainly underline how, how much we appreciate the financial uh, uh, assistance that we are receiving from the EU side for energy, but, but also in general for, for all other, other uh, necessities and needs that we have uh, um, now with the war in uh, Ukraine, but, but, but generally throughout this period of time. Uh, transport, again, very important uh, domain. Uh, just to mention that uh, this uh, Solidarity Lanes project for ensuring grains exports from Ukraine uh, and uh, imports to Ukraine. So we are part of, of this mechanism, and I think it's, it's very important. Uh, I will probably stop here, uh, but uh, certainly ready to go into more details uh, as we move to Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eugen. And uh, well, shows also that um, it's, it's often very difficult to draw a line. Where does the Eastern Partnership end and the bilateral starts? When you look from Brussels, probably everything you do with, for example, Moldova is sort of Eastern Partnership, but then, uh, well, yeah, we are discussing the, let's say, the, the more narrow discussion um, in the sense that uh, trying to, to figure out how to arrange the, the multilateral yeah. um, framework. So um, when we have now listened to three diplomats, well, all rather diplomatic, uh, as one could expect, uh, saying that, yes, it's, it's alive, it should be a bit um, readjusted. Well, Katrina, do you agree with that. Um, is that, um, will that be enough, basically? And, well, sorry, uh, your perspective, I mean, uh, being more neutral, uh, because, well, not only because, and more distant from the discussion, because, not only because you come from across the English Channel, but also from, um, from a more academic perspective. Uh, thank you very much. I am very keen to fit in and be very diplomatic, but I'm afraid I'm going to be rather vocal, um, rather vocal, and not least because I'm in the head-scratching phase myself. And it's a sort of crossroads. Uh, having worked on the Eastern Partnership, on Ukraine, for a very, very long time, now I need to know what I need to do. And in a way, the discussion here actually leaves me sort of a bit sort of uh, ambivalent and confused what is my own homework? Um, so so this, is, this, this is, in a way, the, the sort of, uh, psychotherapy session for me, but I think we need to confront certain issues. Um, and, you know, is the Eastern Partnership um, dead or um, alive? In a way, the last, last comment, what are we talking about when we talk about the Eastern Partnership? Because um, from a legal point of view, the Eastern Partnership is a soft law instrument. It's the ENP which is basically written in the treaties, and the Eastern Partnership was grafted on and has overshadowed the ENP in a way. But from that point of view, it's a cluster of policies and instruments, both bilateral and multilateral. It is also, especially the common policy when it comes, for example, to the summit and to the multilateral platform, but also the Eastern Partnership is about the outcomes the outcomes about the self-selected group of countries which have come forward and delivered on the original 
rationale for the neighborhood policy, to basically uh, promote modernization and reforms via integration with the EU. So from that point of view, the, the Eastern Partnership is a mitigated success story for providing the opportunity um, and in a way advancing the uh, countries on this way in different ways, different speeds. So one of the fundamental, uh, perhaps, success stories of the Eastern Partnership has been its flexibility. I always used to say to my students that we have one Eastern neighborhood, but six countries. So I'm slightly alarmed that we are talking about five countries now, because one country has excluded itself, but we should certainly not exclude. Mm. Um, so from that point of view, uh, we still have six countries. And the fact that Eastern Partnership has been inclusive, it has been an umbrella policy, it's its strength. But now I also feel that it may be its weakness and liability. Because um, with the membership perspective, can we, we need to, have to ask the fundamental questions. And I don't think we can dodge them. Because on the one hand, and I'm a, a student of Dirk here, and I think in 2006 we discussed the difference between enlargement and neighborhood, and there is a fundamental difference. And to what extent the Eastern Partnership countries, the, the two or three of them, can stay in two policies at the same time. And avoiding sort of inefficiencies, duplication, but also uh, avoiding sidetracking. And for me, the Eastern Partnership can deliver on certain issues, but it needs to reformat it, needs to be sort of more task-oriented, so for the right reasons and in the right format. And when it comes to enlargement, uh, I think there is a real danger that we'll have this, you know, the um, words which I've seen, um, terms that I've seen in the literature, it's about, um, it's a bit of smoke scream, it's a bit of sort of diluting, it's a trap or a sidelining. The fact is that, uh, in theory, if we look between the two policies, enlargement should have eclipsed because it's really a much more structured process with stronger incentives, monitoring and conditionality. So how do we ensure that the five you know, countries and enlargement can coexist? This is not easy, because the two policies have existed in literally silos. I was very lucky, very comforting position that until this summer I didn't look at enlargement and the Western Balkans. And there are very few people in Europe who have been keeping track of those two policies. And uh, Stephen Blockman, who is here, is one of those sort of survival, survivors of having this you know, expertise. So uh, Stephen and Michael Emerson are really the two people who can speak to both, uh, on both policies. There are not many people like them, if any. Uh, and that's very important, um, that we actually follow up on that enormous symbolism of granting the membership perspective and really sort of the, the uh, geopolitical sort of awakening being uh, really sort of evidence in that momentous decision, but that actually is consequential. There is this sort of follow-up. And I'm not quite sure how this follow-up can happen in dual tracks of enlargement and the Eastern Partnership. Hence my plea for greater clarity um, Basically, where do we avoid sidetracking or perhaps you know, diluting? And the issue here is that what I've realized, and I think I've been working on the Eastern Partnership and Ukraine, I've been very resilient. I thought I was resilient until I started basically reading about the Western Balkan enlargement. And then I realized that I'm actually sort of snowflake because I didn't realize what I'm taking on. So the, the question is for us, given, you know, I come from Poland, I, you know, I have to beat my chest about backsliding in Poland, etc. But uh, Estonia, Czechia and Poland were success stories because it worked. But that was a whole generation ago. You know, we are old member states now, we are 18, mm -hmm. and the recent generation hasn't been happy at all. So we have enlargement, you know, the membership perspective to the countries which are joining the camp of very unhappy Western Balkan countries. Is uh, Moldova, but especially Ukraine and Georgia, are they going to be added and stuck in that room or are they going actually to unlock the room? 
the jury is out, but in the meantime, we actually have to, um, we actually have to uh, work out our way through linking the policy silos that, that we've had. Each of them incredibly complex, but actually we have no longer luxury of being, staying apart. The challenge is when it comes to the Eastern Partnership is what we've mentioned. The association agreements have been phenomenal, uh, and I am basically a victim. I'm very, very keen on SPS, I'm very keen on TBT, um, um, on ACA, on the energy aki. I am out of my depth. You know, how many people in this room can talk about the Green Deal with Ukrainian officials? Uh, I'm basically, uh, because it's, it's a different game. Environmental, you know, waste management. We talk about environmental standards, the way Ukrainians talk about this, and what, let's say, Azerbaijan may be interested in, or Armenia, those are two very, detail, very difficult, different, I think the English say, kettles of fish. Um, so the level of ambition, but also expertise, and complexity, what we are dealing with, especially when it comes to the uh, single market and sectoral are key. The second issue is um, the issue of resources. I think the Eastern Partnership have been phenomenally successful in attracting very able and committed officials in the ES and in the delegation. And yet, we've all been firefighting. I mean, we are dealing with the most open access war in history. We are have to daily following what's happening there, what's happening in Moldova, you know, Georgia, and between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We are firefighting in terms of actually, and building, going on our enthusiasm. And I remember when it comes to enlargement and the Eastern Partnership, one of the directors in DG Near told uh, me that for Albania, he um, basically, he had two people working on Georgia and 12 on Albania. And this is the difference between the Eastern Partnership and enlargement. And I don't think we can basically avoid, because the level of ambition and complexity is so much higher, that we can deal with the existing resources. So we have to migrate the portfolio because in Moldova, people told me, officials, whom do we call in Brussels? And they actually said they were calling colleagues in Sweden because they had a, twin, a bilateral like assistance program with Sweden. So they were calling, it, it was easier to call someone in Stockholm than in, uh, in Brussels. So where are the resources in Brussels to deal with waste management directives or whatever you would like to discuss? Um, so this is my, and the uh, one uh, third point, the penultimate point, is about this sort of uh, duplication and inefficiency. Uh, we are all firefighting. Uh, do we want to stretch our resources? It's great that perhaps Ukrainians can talk to Armenians, but is it the best use of limited resources inside Ukraine? Uh, I think we need to think about this carefully. And the final and perhaps the biggest point, and I will be happy because I need to uh, keep my sort of remarks um, perhaps not short, but not, not that long, is um, the issue of credibility. I mean, if we avoid uh, tackling the big question of the, what Ukraine's, Moldova, and potentially Georgia sort of um, accession process, what does it mean for the enlargement, the whole enlargement process in terms of methodology, political wealth, will and absorption capacity, we are fundamentally tackling the issue of um, enlargement and dealing sort of with the unresolved sort of uh, problems we have been accumulated. And I feel that, you know, keeping us in our comfort zone, and I'm certainly very happy within the Eastern Partnership, really sort of sidetracks and camouflages and prevents us from addressing and tackling those big questions on about and blocking sort of the enlargement process and giving you a new lease of life. Um, so, so those are my concerns. As I said, it's more like a sort of a therapy session, listing the problems rather than offering the solutions. Um, so the, uh, for me, the Eastern Partnership, really, I would like in ideal life to, to, um, life to rename about Eastern Partnerships a set of relations and making it tailored, agile, in terms of being responsive. But ultimately, we will have to migrate um, at least for uh, Ukraine, Moldova, um, and then potentially Georgia, to the enlargement portfolio to make it 
work. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina, and uh, thank you for pointing out many of the complexities. Well, let's move to the discussion phase. And to kick it off, if I may start myself with a slightly wonkish question. Well, it's uh, Dirk mentioned as well, you know, one solution, how to make the partnership better, would be to have fewer meetings, well, better meetings. Um, this reminds me of my time in Brussels, where there were occasional blasts of um, optimism and, and discussion about uh, making uh, meetings better. Well, never happened, though, unfortunately. Um, but um, do you think, all of you, um, there is still scope for that? Can creative solutions be found? And uh, perhaps starting from, um, Ojen, from you, um, as a partner country, um, would you be comfortable with uh, some meetings taking place with, let's say, two or three partners, and if Moldova wouldn't be among them? Is it, is it okay? I mean, could, would you ima imagine an area where Moldova doesn't have that keen interest and, and will let, let others meet and uh, you wouldn't bother? Well, uh, uh, we are used to be uh, one family, so it's, um, it's being together. And I think uh, in the, the, the last period of time, uh, we, we, had, uh, we have had and we still have this trio, which is uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova. And we have this uh, council conclusion uh, where, whereby um, uh, Georgia has European perspective, uh, including Moldova uh, also with Ukraine, and, and um, Moldova and Ukraine having also additionally the, the candidate state status. So my point is that I think uh, I think we we would we would be keen on keeping this trio very much in place. Um, we would uh, we would also be keen on keeping the whole uh, partnership in place. Uh, uh, Again, there are, uh, uh, there are d different uh, speeds, uh, but, uh, but what we are saying is that we should be <clears throat> judged on merits. Uh, so uh, ultimately, of course, the Commission would look while reporting next, uh, next autumn on enlargement package. They, they will be assessing individually how partners perform. Uh, and uh, but we we don't uh, we don't see um, uh, we we don't see the point of uh, making now maybe uh, different formats. We, we we have to 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 see the. Uh, I think the Eastern Partnership should be uh, enough of flexibility given to this uh, to this policy. But at the same time, uh, we would be we would be ready to stay all together, to work uh, to work together on what's possible. Uh, we we have different um, ambitions, uh, we have uh, different uh, speed, but uh, but this shouldn't prevent, for instance, Moldova moving at our own speed, as as uh, the the Dutch. Uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, the, the, the envoy for Eastern Partnership was saying in the previous uh, session, the reforms are our own reforms. It's not the EU reforms. It's us doing our reforms. So we will be doing our Moldovan reforms. Um, the Commission will, uh, will assess according to, to, to these reforms but uh, we don't break uh, rows, so to say, now. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wants to come in on that? I, I think you, 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 you mentioned very clearly that, uh, of course, there needs to be a will if we want to uh, get more efficient and uh, tailor-made. We, um, if we continue to doing the once for all and uh, approach and that everybody is participating in everything, then there will be no change whatsoever. But I think the, uh, it will probably automatically happen, as Katarina already said, because uh, the shift, the gradual shift into the enlargement process will come. 
Uh, we don't know how fast it will go. We hope, I personally hope it goes very fast, but it depends on, on the progress that you, all, you three are making and, uh, and of course, on our assessment. Uh, but then automatically you will not have time anymore. To, you, have, you yourself will not have the resources to, to, to do both, basically. That is, I think, uh, because your resources are also limited in, uh, in all uh, three uh, uh, countries with accession perspective. So, um, and on our side, I can tell you that, of course, there, are, there is already thinking ongoing that, to, that of course, uh, uh, for Moldova and, uh, and Georgia in the commission services, more resources are needed to, to tackle this process. First, starting in DG Near, but not only, also in the, in the, in the uh, what we call line DGs in our internal jargon, um, there will be also more, more people needed. Ukraine is a different case because Ukraine is well staffed. Uh, we have the support group for Ukraine that uh, some of you will know, and they are well staffed. They have people in Kiev under normal circumstances and also in, in, in Brussels, a big team. So I think for Ukraine this will be easier, this transformation process, than it will be for the others. But obviously uh, that is also what we are <laughs> reflecting upon. Uh, we have discovered this as well. And, um, um, uh, and for the time being, it's basically us, the external action service that fulfills the tasks uh, that perhaps uh, in, in, in the case of uh, the Western Balkan countries is already now carried out by the, by the commission services. But uh, I fear we will have to get to this point where we will not have meetings on everything with everyone. We will have to be more efficient also if we want that uh, this policy uh, will be will making a contribution to this uh, forward moving proce process in particular for the three, uh, but also for the other countries. Well, maybe we can conclude that point by saying that uh, after the enforced um, period of um, Zoom meetings, all physical meetings are good and you know, everybody will be happy uh, eventually. But well, let's move to the audience and uh, James Scherer. Here you go. Thank you. When NATO set up Partnership for Peace in the early 1990s, I was spending a lot of time in Poland and other Central European countries, and there was a feeling of frustration and dejection because those countries felt, instead of being offered a path to membership, they were being escorted into a waiting room, and the waiting room would become permanent. But the Russians at the time saw PFP as the preparatory school for membership, and they were right. You look at the relationship between enlargement and partnership, it's not the same. The Russians were more concerned more apprehensive about Eastern Partnership in 2009 when it was unveiled than I think they are now. And maybe again, they are right. So my question to you is, what steps do you think the Eastern Partnership has to take to persuade Europe, its own members of the Partnership, that it's not a substitute for enlargement, but part of the preparation for enlargement. Can you think of a single concrete measure that needs to be taken to change this perception and atmosphere? Thanks. Thank you. Well, yeah, the, the fact that um, you're paranoid doesn't mean that you're, you're necessarily wrong. Uh, the, the fact that you're paranoid doesn't mean that you're wrong, uh, speaking about uh, neighbours. I've been living with that truth most of my life. <laughs> but uh, who, will, who will take that question? Well, I think I, I, this is a very good question, and, and of course uh, we have been uh, discussing this for several months, we, because we do, uh, we do state to the partner countries that you should not be worried. Uh, staying on, uh, staying in the Eastern Partnership will by no means, you know, stall your EU accession. Uh, but uh, we do understand that it takes more of convincing the partner countries that this is, this is really the case. And I think that we will also need to enter into a discussion with the partner countries. How can we convince them uh, what our Dutch colleague was also talking about earlier, that we are with the partner countries at least with the trio, uh, so to say, when it comes to enlargement. Um, uh, 
what is needed in order for them to, to, to feel uh, comfortable. Because we can all be very, very united among the EU27 that uh, this is not by any by no means stalling the countries, but if they feel that this is what, 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 what is at stake, then uh, I, can, I can imagine that they will not be too keen on engaging in different Eastern Partnership events uh, for the years to come. James, I think what I'm going to speak now only under my own control, I hope uh, uh, this is uh, <laughs> clear. I think we, we might need to think about a certain subordination of the Eastern Partnership into the enlargement process that to make it clear also administratively in one way or another for the three, yeah. for the trio, yeah. not for the others, obviously, um, unless things change. Uh, but in a way to make it administratively clear that this process, that these partnership serves the purpose to help the, uh, the, uh, the, the countries to move forward uh, in certain areas, in certain steps. I think that would uh, maybe be such a step uh, to, to, de to demonstrate this. Uh, others, other ideas I have not got right now either, to be honest. But uh, it's worthwhile reflecting indeed to make uh, this clear that these hesitations or these doubts will, will, be, will, be, will be pushed away. Thank you. Can I come? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Continue. Can I just come back very quickly on this, um, on enlargement? Uh, paradoxically, I think that jury is out on the new Eastern Partnership to what extent it is actually able to deliver on enlargement. Doesn't sidetrack, but actually allows um, this. So from, the, from that point of view, um, that the EU means, means business when it comes to enlargement and keeping the Eastern Partnership alive is not sidetracking and providing this smokescreen, especially when it comes, because we need to remember that for mem many member states, the June decision was the high time of geopolitical awakening, of solidarity. It was not consequential in terms of actually follow-up steps. So there is really, we are, uh, to what extent, perhaps for some member states, the Eastern Partnership is to camouflage the lack of commitment to enlarge. Uh, and, and for me, that, that's very important because we need to confront, basically, the, the, the challenges um, head, head on. And from that point of view, the issue of homework. We tend to always talk about homework for the Western Balkan countries or for the Eastern Partnership countries, the homework for the EU. Where are we you know, with those reforms of the enlargement uh, methodology? And where are we on issues, for example, which some member states are very keen on? I'm reluctant to use the word deepening, but perhaps streamlining, making the EU um, function better. Where are we in that process? Because some member states are very explicit. It's a sine qua non for any basically prospect for accession. Until and unless we open that discussion, however reluctant and difficult that portfolio may be, we are actually uh, not really engaging with that difficult agenda. Um, so I'm afraid this is my, in a way, homework for the EU plea in terms of preparation and credibility in the end. Okay. If I could also uh, um, offer my, my uh, perspective on, on this issue, when, uh, when the Eastern Partnership started and unfolded, we were always told that Eastern Partnership is not an enlargement policy, so it doesn't provide enlargement. But we were never shy to say that we want accession, we want to join the Union, so uh, as the, the rest of the trio, but uh, did. Uh, so uh, uh, what happened uh, in June was, was really um, a recognition uh, by the member states uh, upon the, the decision, also upon the, the recommendation and opinion of the Commission that these, uh, these countries aspire and, and have the chance to, to join if they, if they qualify uh, and meet the criteria. So, uh, and then it, it's sort of graduating from the Eastern Partnership to the next level. 
and uh, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, that has happened and this is uh, experience of moldova and i think uh, but now i think it's 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 clear that uh, unfortunately uh, it's it's clear that the eu is taking uh, courageous and bold steps in meeting the aspirations of other countries no matter who is concerned if there is any concern somewhere, it's EU and partners deciding how they want to build a relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there was um, a really experienced Eastern Partnership hand waving um, in the back of the audience. Marga. Uh, yeah, Marga Martisel Gohar, uh, MFA, Estonian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, has been really a great uh, therapy, uh, at least for those of us. Uh, that have been dealing with Eastern Partnership for, for more than a, a decade. Um, just to reflect on a couple of things uh, that, yeah, that uh, was said uh, at the panel. Uh, well, I think one of the conclusions is that, uh, I mean, we all need time. Eastern Partnership was, a, uh, was an instrument that was designed for a different geopolitical reality. Now this reality has changed. And, uh, and one of the questions that has been very uh, legitimately raised also here, that how can Eastern Partnership be relevant uh, for the enlargement, in the context of the enlargement. Um, the second point is, uh, and, and uh, this was the, uh, I think what Dirk said about the flexibility. Do we need more flexibility in it? You pointed out having different geographical formats. Uh, maybe it would be also helpful to start with a, starting by, by defining what the Eastern Partnership is. That this is not an objective or a status in itself, but rather an uh, instrument that helps us to accomplish uh, different tasks. And um, uh, when it comes to the flexibility, maybe um, in addition to this geographical uh, Aspect. And this is my question now maybe to Dirk or to, to, uh, to incoming presidency. Do you see also more flexibility in terms of um, bringing those different silos together? We have different instruments uh, also. Compass was just very recently taken. Resilience is one of the key words also when it comes to the Eastern Partnership. Do we have any, I don't know, some interaction synergies when it comes to those different needs, if we, we are talking about needs-based uh, flexibility. Uh, is this a direction that we can develop this instrument? Thank you. Thank you, Marga. And uh, well, while you think, let's take another question as well, because we are already soon running out of time. So that one of the very few people who can see um, with both eyes, so to say, um, uh, the, the complex matter, Stephen. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. My question is to, to Dirk, um, but the others should, by all means, feel free to, uh, to jump in as well. If I understand you correctly, the current thinking is really to turn the Eastern Partnership in an on-demand type of um, vehicle to structure relations with uh, Eastern neighbors. Um, is that denying the EU itself uh, a strategic goal uh, to, to serve its geopolitical interests. Um, should it be more active in that, uh, take more ownership of structuring and driving the Eastern Partnership uh, in, in the future? And how would that relate to the definition or redefinition of uh, the EU's strategic outlook on Russia? Right, thank you. Well, breaking the silos, uh, Russia. Dirk, you want to go first? Um, yes, Stephen, very good question. Um, we have, of course, um, we, have this, we have this discussion currently ongoing, and as I said also in my uh, introductory words, uh, whatever plan we make now, or whatever decision we take, be more flexible, be, uh, offer more ownership to the partners, which I think is a must, if you ask me. Um, it can be overhauled in a blink of an eye when we see new developments on the, on the front in, uh, in, in Ukraine, I think. So we have to, 
always look with one eye there, which shouldn't prevent us from uh, developing certain certain ideas. Um, I think uh, uh, I think there's a, there's indeed a, a discrepancy between, on the other hand, a more geopolitical role that you intends to play, uh, qua uh, President von der Leyen, and, and uh, I think we have also demonstrated on a few occasions that I also mentioned that we have started doing so. We were also forced to do so, of course, due to the Ukraine uh, war, uh, Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, on the other hand, giving more ownership to the partners. So there's a, there's something which we we have to match probably, which will not be an easy task. Um, um, I think the, 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 there is no final uh, answer I can give you at this, at this stage uh, in which direction we want to go. Uh, I think we have to f strike the right balance between these two uh, elements, uh, but all of this will depend on the overall developments. It's, um, I, I have no better answer right now. Um, do we, uh, Marge, do we, uh, uh, are there any linking elements? Um, it's a very good question because there are not too many right now, I, I see. We have, uh, unfortunately, of course, we have the Commission, we have the External Action Service, and if you're honest to ourselves, of course, each club wants to do uh, uh, the maximum interesting things uh, still. Uh, and um, we are trying to, of course, there's lots of uh, coordination meetings, but um, I think once we have a clear view on, uh, on uh, how fast you can move, the trio can move, uh, then we also um, uh, will, have, will be forced. The faster this process will move, the more we will be forced also to, uh, to, to create these links uh, between the institutions and not only between Commission and uh, EAS, but also with the Parliament uh, and with the other uh, bodies uh, of, the European, of the European Union. Um, and I think the same goes for member states, uh, if you ask me. I think in your, in your uh, governments you will have to do, go the same step. Uh, to involve uh, also the line ministries more to, uh, to, to give a view on uh, what Katarina mentioned on waste management uh, directive X and so on, uh, mm -hmm. the Green Deal Y, uh, that we uh, bureaucratic diplomats might probably not be able to, <laughs> to, to answer. Um, so uh, we are in the, unfortunately still at an early stage, but uh, I think we will be forced to go in exactly into this direction. Thank you. Christina. I can also just echo what Dirk just said, and, and also to reflect on the fact that, I mean, the war in Ukraine is moving the Eastern Partnership in different directions towards other formats, other, uh, other structures, and uh, that creates a lot of discussions uh, and the need for interaction and overlapping and, and uh, new focus for, for the Eastern Partnership, but I think we are not just yet there uh, in these discussions. And I think, to be honest, that, I mean, the, the war in Ukraine and the repercussions of this geopolitical disaster is eating so much resources, both in Brussels and in our capitals. So we are not in, you know, in a position where we can, where we can have a big strategic discussion also on the Eastern Partnership. And I think that is why I echoed maybe a bit of a defensive position that let's not rush. That is, of course, also due to the fact that, that, that resources uh, are being pulled all the time towards, towards Ukraine. But, uh, but um, I mean, when we are discussing resilience, uh, uh, and security issues. Of course, we are, we are from the Eastern Partnership side now entering into the area of, of, of other structures, of other you know, organizations. We also had the EPC, the European Political Community, yet another format uh, coming forward. I think there will be a need for more of coordination and more of exploring where we can have synergies. But um, to be quite, quite honest, and this is maybe me just describing what is happening in Stockholm, we are at least not quite there yet. But I hope we will get there. Well, thank you very much. Well, actually, as the, the number on the counter has turned red, which is not necessarily a good thing. So uh, we should uh, stop here, I feel, without any formal closing words for, for all the participants. I can only say that, uh, well, the therapy session hopefully has been useful, but as Marik also concluded that the previous session, many discussions lie ahead of us on that topic as well, not least um, at the ministerial level in December in Brussels, but in other formats as well. And, um, well, uh, building on what somebody said, um, now that we have 
achieve the achievable, let's move on to achieving uh, what initially seemed inachievable, and well, which might actually turn out to be achievable as well. So uh, thank you very much, dear panelists, and um, Slava Ukraini. Slava. And what coffee break is the next item on the agenda?
Good uh, afternoon. I see that the microphone is uh, working well. Uh, pleased to be here in Tallinn and uh, moderate this uh, third uh, panel uh, on the Eastern Partnership and Enlargement uh, Conference. I'm aware that uh, I am competing with uh, World Cup game uh, Germany, Japan. Uh, so I'm very pleased that uh, those uh, who uh, uh, turned up uh, are eager to discuss uh, this very interesting uh, topic, uh, uh, how um, uh, reforms uh, contribute uh, uh, to the process uh, of uh, accession. Uh, I would uh, first like to start by introducing the uh, panelists. Uh, I will go uh, order uh, from uh, me to the, to the left. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Kivi uh, Makanadze, uh, who is the first uh, deputy chair of the uh, faction of uh, the Georgian Dream uh, uh, in uh, Georgian Parliament, and also the, the member of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. Uh, next uh, is uh, Petar Markovic, Ambassador Petar Markovic, uh, who is the head of the mission of uh, Montenegro uh, to the European Union. And then uh, we have uh, Jan Marin, uh, a former colleague of mine from uh, Brussels, uh, currently working as the special envoy for uh, Eastern Partnership in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Czech Republic. And uh, last but not least, we have also a video connection with uh, uh, Mikhailo Zhernakov uh, from Kiev. Mikhailo, please wave if you are uh, connected and can hear us uh, well. Can you hear us, Mikhailo? It seems that there might be an issue with, uh, with the connection, which we will sort out. Mikhailo is the co-founder uh, and the chair of the board of uh, the Jura Foundation, which is one of the leading uh, NGOs in Ukraine um, working on the anti-corruption and uh, justice sector uh, reform. Uh, we also know that uh, Mikhailo had recently an uh, air alarm in Kiev, uh, but I think mm. that now he's, he's available, at least we, we can see him. Uh, before we, I uh, open up the, the discussion uh, of the panelists, I would like to uh, uh, put forward some uh, milestones or facts which will uh, orient us a little bit uh, in this discussion. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned during the previous uh, panels, but uh, I think it, it would be helpful to recall them uh, to, to facilitate uh, our panel as well. Um, first, uh, what I would like to say is that we have here uh, a representative of uh, uh, Montenegro, uh, who is uh, Montenegro, which is a country that is considered to be a front runner in enlargement uh, process, uh, a country that has been a candidate country of the European or Union already since 2010 where the opening negotiations were opened uh, in 2012, uh, and the country that uh, has already opened uh, all the chapters uh, for negotiations and has already provisionally closed uh, two of them. Uh, then we have um, um, uh, two countries represented uh, who were granted uh, in June, a um, uh, European perspective, uh, Ukraine became the candidate country, uh, and uh, Georgia uh, got the European perspective uh, and the uh, possibility to become candidate country if some uh, uh, priority issues will be, uh, will be solved. Uh, most related to the um, uh, anti-corruption, uh, justice sector reform, and also fundamental uh, rights. Uh, now, um, when it comes to uh, Georgia and Moldova, uh, we will be reporting on the progress uh, against the Commission's opinion uh, uh, in um, uh, 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 fall in autumn next year, uh, which will be then uh, part of the broader uh, enlargement uh, package. When I say we, then this means uh, European Commission. 
uh, uh, but this uh, does not mean that uh, we uh, do not uh, uh, work uh, in between with those countries. Of course we do, we are very much engaged and, and supporting uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, Moldova and Georgia in um, fulfilling uh, those steps and conditions that need to be, need to be done. I should also add that um, uh, by the end of the year we will issue uh, the um, analytical report, uh, which is still part of the Commission opinion process, which basically gives an overview where uh, the, uh, the three countries are in terms of um, uh, capacities to implement the uh, European Union key in different uh, chapters. And this will already give a, a quite good indication the state of uh, or level of preparations uh, taking over the, the key. Uh, maybe a last point on, on, on Georgia and Ukraine uh, is that uh, while uh, uh, preparing uh, for, for next steps on uh, the accession process, uh, we also work in parallel in integrating uh, uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Georgia with the EU uh, internal uh, market uh, and uh, also sectoral cooperation, which uh, both countries have been very, very keen on. In my panel, uh, I would like to focus on three issues. Uh, I would uh, like to discuss uh, um, how the European um, uh, Union membership perspective uh, can create uh, reform uh, momentum and how this can be sustained uh, over time. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to elaborate, uh, panelists to elaborate on the uh, challenges uh, that are there in uh, delivering uh, against the uh, European Union expectations and uh, priorities. And then, as a third point, uh, how can uh, the European Union, uh, uh, both Commission and Member State, uh, support uh, this uh, process? Uh, my uh, first question uh, goes uh, better to you. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to know, uh, as you have this experience for uh, quite a long, uh, long time now, how the, uh, the membership perspective and, uh, and the candidate country status and also the uh, um, negotiation process motivate uh, Montenegro to reform, uh, and particularly in those areas which uh, the EU has considered important for the enlargement uh, process. And how is it possible uh, uh, for a country to sustain this uh, support uh, of the population over a long period of time? Please, Peter, to First you. of all, um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have to agree with Dirk and some other uh, participants and panelists who in um, well joining them in saying that uh, I think that this conference which focuses on Eastern partnership with the now advancement of the trio to uh, I'm sure all three candidates very soon um, means that we can also start co making the debate more complex and perhaps turning this into a conference on enlargement um, Secondly, uh, as the front runner and the country which has now been uh, um, now celebrating 10 years of accession talks, um, Montenegro does have a lesson to share on, on keeping the momentum of reforms alive. Indeed, uh, when we applied for membership in 2008, uh, we became a candidate in 2010 and we started negotiating in 2012. Um, and this has indeed been a, a catalyst, an accelerator, a, a, a really a motor for reforms to the extent that EU accession can be synonymous in Montenegro with genuine uh, economic and political reforms. It would be a very tough mental experiment to try to uh, keep genuine reforms running without the normative power of attraction that uh, the promise of membership in the EU has. Uh, in Montenegro and in the Western Balkans. This being said, um, I would like to say that there were at least two phases in our um, tango with the EU. Uh, the first was certainly the honeymoon era. It was a stage uh, of 
extremely high motivation of our public administration at the very start of the negotiations to really be swift, efficient, thorough. Um, and it was a big accelerated process of institutional learning, of epistemological uh, meeting with Brussels, um, and it was very productive. Um, it lasted, let's say, and somewhere between 2012 and 2016. Then we started entering a second phase, uh, a certain slowdown of um, the momentum. And um, I'm, I'm always uh, reminded of psychotherapy when I listen to different explanations between Brussels and Western Balkans on who is primarily to blame for um, the accession negotiations lasting a bit too long. Um, it reminds me of Melanie Klein's uh, developmental theories and basically uh, one position which is the um, it sounds bad, it's, but it's not really that bad. It's a schizophrenic paranoid position where you project the blame to outside. So often enough, Western Balkan countries will say it's Brussels and member states' fault. The credibility of the membership perspective is not really genuine uh, or the demands keep changing. This moving target is too fast. Um, and then there is the depressive position, the, other, the opposing one, where uh, we flagellate ourselves and we say basically what our Dutch colleagues said today, which in many Western Balkan cases is actually the truth, that once reforms reach a point of vested interests, and these are the vested interests of usually local economic and political elites, then these reforms turn into simulation or just come to a halt. And neither of these two positions actually paints the full picture. The full picture is a, a combination of the two. Um, so uh, to go back to the, uh, to the story of Montenegro's rapprochement with the EU, uh, after a slowdown happened, it was then formalized in the form of the activation of the balance clause, um, first in, uh, informally. Uh, balance clause, meaning that no progress will be made in the future of negotiations until uh, progress in fundamentals has been reached. For Montenegro, this informally started already in 2018 and has been there since. So uh, with the adoption of the revised methodology, it's been codified in a way that Montenegro cannot close any other negotiation chapters until the Commission has uh, produced what we call IBAR, or the Interim Benchmark Assessment Report, uh, in which it states that we have reached enough reforms in the area of chapters 23 and 24. We are still at this stage, um, whereas we are really making progress in other chapters which cannot be recognized until uh, rule of law um, is um, bettered. Um, just in this year's report, um, we've made better progress in nine chapters than in last year's report. Um, so uh, we are still waiting for the deadlock in the rule of law to, to be resolved. But to give advice and to then uh, conclude with that to our Eastern partners and to the trio, um, the more you achieve in the first few years of accession negotiations, the better, because at some point um, inertia uh, frustration, fatigue will kick in and then it's much more difficult to keep the elan and the motivation of public administration at high. Our citizens have proven to be much more resilient. I have to say that the support for EU membership in Montenegro is unwaveringly between 70 and 80 percent. If we had a referendum on EU membership today, 86 percent of our citizens would vote in favor. Um, but our political elites don't have the condition to run a marathon as much as our citizens, it seems, and that is a lesson for the Eastern Trio. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Petar. Uh, I think that uh, this is very interesting and also a very good preach uh, uh, to the questions that I would like to ask uh, both from, uh, from, from Kivi and uh, from Mikhailo. Uh, and this is uh, how in your countries, of course, bearing in mind that uh, the period has been uh, uh, relatively short. And in addition, of course, uh, in Ukraine, we are dealing with uh, tremendous challenges related to war. Uh, how in your countries, uh, in this uh, short period of time, the uh, 
opinion by the Commission and the decision by the European leaders has uh, given a new momentum to the, to the reforms. Kivi, maybe you start and then we hand over to Mikhail. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, uh, let me express my gratitude for, in, for your kind invitation and giving possibility just to share with the information and update you about the progress which has been achieved after the uh, European uh, Council decision about granting uh, perspective, European perspective was given in June, at the end of June, to Georgia. Uh, just uh, uh, since that period, uh, without any delay, without any postponing any kind of activities, we have uh, uh, been so much dedicated to work on those 12 points plan, which have been defined for getting the status of candidate. And uh, uh, in the first week of July, uh, uh, we have presented a very uh, thorough plan with a very detailed uh, activities, how these 12 points should be implemented, what will be the time frame for each, which committees of the parliament will be responsible and assigned per uh, particular activity. And uh, uh, during uh, July, August, there were formed nine working groups within the framework of the rules of procedure of the parliament. Um, and uh, we've conducted uh, up to 60 working meetings. There were a number of several meetings every week which were dedicated to uh, consider any kind of amendments in response to these uh, uh, reforms. We clearly understand uh, that reforms are the key area which should be done for getting uh, final membership of the European Union. And always we were very much dedicated to the, those reforms. And Georgia was always a, a front runner among Eastern Partnership countries in uh, reforms. Uh, therefore, we continue. And if we see those 12 points, the uh, majority of those activities directly derive from the association agreement. And at this stage, we can say that 54% of those activities which are foreseen by the association agreement have been already fulfilled by Georgia. However, we clearly understand that there are some uh, relevant avenues where we should work more. And therefore, uh, starting from July, we've started implementation of this action plan. Uh, that was very unfortunate that three out of seven opposition parties, without any explanation from the beginning, rejected to participate in this process. Um, they did not do any explanation, and it was some kind of a contradictory to what uh, European Council and European Commission told to us to make it more inclusive, this process. The civil society organizations were involved from the very beginning, and it has to be mentioned that we have been dealing with the uh, Eastern Partnership Platform, which unites more than 200 non-governmental organizations, and they were uh, taking decision uh, which organizations will be more relevant to be um, uh, involved and engaged in activities of various um, uh, uh, groups. Uh, in September uh, and in October, uh, most of those groups have uh, finalized their work and relevant amendments have been developed uh, by those working groups. They have been initiated uh, by the relevant committees in the parliament and a number of them, they have already passed three hearings and have been adopted with a majority support and with uh, most involvement of uh, opposition parties. Um, as regards to others, I can say that the process is underway. And in a number of cases, for instance, if we take judiciary reform or if we take the election code reform, I'm personally in charge of the uh, election code reform because I'm chairing the working group on that direction. We have also put as a, uh, some kind of a condition that after first hearing it will be adopted, it should be sent to the Venice Commission and the OSCOD for additional expert support and expert opinion. What we know at this stage is that tentatively the OSCOD and the Venice Commission will provide with its um, expert opinion regarding the election code somewhere in mid-December. Therefore, we have just frozen for a while this process. Uh, however, uh, it was a very positive approach that those three parties, opposition parties, 
approached us after first hearing adoption. They've informed us that they really like what has been developed and adopted. However, they have some ideas to exchange. And we've started negotiations with them. And at this point, we've conducted two working meetings with them. And we have found out many touchable elements with them, which will be included in the amended legislation during second hearing, but of course, first of all, we are waiting for the response from the Venice Commission and the OSCOD. However, if we say in a general roughly point, out of 10 proposals which were discussed, eight have been agreed, which is, in my personal opinion, is a positive step to have more inclusive process. However, I can say that the inclusive point of everyone has been guaranteed anyway, because when the working groups have finalized their work and the relevant legislation have been uh, amended, um, no, sorry, the draft bills have been uh, presented to the committee hearings, all opposition parties, civil society organizations, uh, any interested persons could have possibility just to attend, put their opinion and questions to the presenters, as well as it has been discussed on a plenary sessions. Um, there are several key areas where we um, uh, work uh, to develop more. For instance, like um, we have recently um, uh, just adopted uh, uh, with the second hearing the legislation about anti-corruption activities. If you uh, see, uh, if you just uh, go to the international rankings, Georgia is uh, holding quite a good position during last years, and not only with the legislation, but with practical activities. However, we are more than um, just dedicated to improve in this direction. So we will be setting up a special bureau, uh, which will be some kind of a coordination agency of all those state institutions which are dealing uh, with the fight against corruption. When we go to the deoligarchization uh, uh, law legislation, here we found out that the only country uh, which has a law on deoligarchization is Ukraine. And Ukraine has adopted a law a year ago, which has been uh, drafted uh, with participation and involvement of European experts. And it has been positively assessed by uh, uh, Madame um, uh, 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 Viola von der Leyen when she made a statement about this legislation. Therefore, we had really a direct decision just to translate this uh, law into Georgian, and uh, it has been already adopted with the second hearing. We are waiting for the expert opinion from the Venice Commission, which has been uh, presented, and the Ukraine has presented this law to the Venice Commission for additional expert opinion. And we don't see any additional need for presenting because this is directly the same. It's just translated document. So as soon as uh, Ukraine will get a response from the Venice Commission, this opinion will be also considered in the Georgian reality. Mm -hmm. uh, as regards to the judiciary, also here, we have developed a draft legislation regarding to make, to strength, to make stronger the capacity of the judiciary and independence and the guarantees. Therefore, this uh, uh, draft uh, uh, law, uh, even it has not been presented for the hearing, already on 10th of November has been sent to the Venice Commission for further expert opinion. Mm -hmm. In this regard, we say that in many directions, we have already achieved really tangible results, and this process will be continuing. We were planning just to fulfill all those 12 points obligations by the end of this year. However, we were in number of activities depending on our international partners, the Venice Commission and the OSCOD. As mm -hmm. far as their opinion will be presented on a little bit later point, it means that this process will go to the uh, next year, so in the first decade of the next year. However, we are uh, also informed that uh, uh, the assessment, the preliminary assessment will start in the springtime and the final assessment will be done somewhere in October, autumn period of the next year. So we will be very much prepared for this process and we are ready and we are very much open for communication, consultations, for expert opinions and any kind of involvement which can uh, give more improvements to this process. Kiwi, thanks a lot. I think that uh, you mentioned some of the issues uh, 
which we will hopefully also uh, discuss in further detail, like uh, justice sector reform, uh, the oligarchization and, and anti-corruption. Uh, Mikhailo, uh, I would like to hand uh, now uh, the floor over to you, uh, and uh, it will also be interesting uh, from this point of view that you uh, represent a very active uh, civil society in Ukraine, uh, sometimes critical but always uh, supportive of, uh, of Ukraine and definitely uh, very helpful in terms of uh, EU integration process. So the question to you is the same. Since the decision in, uh, in June, what has happened in Ukraine? What kind of momentum and what kind of progress? Floor over to you. Thank you, Thank you. Yes. You can speak louder. You can speak louder if you can. Yes. Yes. judicial reform is a number one uh, priority when it comes to our acquiring the candidacy status and further uh, the opening of the negotiations. Uh, so out of seven points that we have on this agenda is a number one thing, which we of course afloat and myself as, as uh, somebody who's involved deeply in judicial reforms, of course we very much welcome this decision and this shows how, how important this really is. Because without the rule of law, you know, there, there's, there's zero successful countries in the world that do not have the rule of law. Now, um, if um, the legislation, to, there are three institutions mentioned in uh, this number one priority. Um, and if, uh, when it comes to two other institutions, uh, the legislation was already there, so we were in the, kind of in the middle of the reform. Uh, it seemed like nothing could move the uh, constitutional court reform that was very... It's, and, and that is paramount for uh, rule of law in Ukraine. Even though we had big scandals with the Constitutional Court uh, a couple of years ago, issuing a very unlawful decision, killing uh, essentially killing a lot of anti-corruption infrastructure. So there were big scandals, huge problems with the Constitutional Court, with the Euro Commission involved and with the Venice Commission involved. It seemed like nothing could move the uh, Constitutional Court reform now when it got mentioned in these seven points. It got traction and uh, really now we have, uh, we, we just got the candidacy in June, late June, and two months later we already got the bill on the constitutional court reform and a couple of weeks later was already adopted in the first reading. Of course, so it, it shows how, how really important and how significant this uh, process is and how uh, really uh, the, this, this status and this process helps uh, to promote reforms that were, say, impossible or nearly impossible before. But of course, very quickly uh, doesn't often mean very well. We know that you know Ukraine is very passionate about very quickly doing uh, everything connected to euro integration. We submitted the 
you know, the questionnaire in, in, in I don't know, in a very short time, and then all, all the other stages we, we went through quite quickly. But now, uh, when it comes to reforms, really uh, very quickly does not mean very well. And uh, when it comes to the Constitutional Court reform, for example, there are uh, very important Venice Commission suggestions uh, or recommendations that were not taken into account, such as the involvement of the civil society in the selection process of the judges and other things. Um, now, there's another Venice Commission opinion pending. Uh, hopefully soon uh, it will be released and, and uh, you know, the reform will uh, continue. Other reforms have also started moving. The uh, anti-oligarchization anti uh, was mentioned also today, the anti-corruption efforts, legislation on media. So um, things got traction really, very important sectors, very important spheres. But of course, we uh, have to consider everything uh, very carefully for the second reading because it is now very important, as in any reform, to uh, you know devils very often in the detail, and uh, it's important to not overlook the uh, the, the very important things uh, in in this kind of um, quest or in this uh, attempt at doing things uh, quickly and moving really uh, forward. And especially in times of war, it's it's. Uh, Particularly complicated because not you know we have not many uh, democratic um, instruments available to us that are otherwise that we otherwise use you know peaceful assemblies open committee hearings uh, things like this are not present uh, because of the martial law uh, that is why it is it, it is extremely important to um, stay vigilant on both sides and uh, really design reforms in a way that will benefit and that will move. Um, Ukraine forward and uh, make it a real uh, democracy for the rule of law and uh, of course that it will later contribute to uh, you know the bigger uh, European family and, and be a really a really uh, strong member of the EU. Thank you. Thank you Mikhailov. This was a very useful uh, input uh, to our discussion. Uh, Jan, I now turn over to you. Uh, you are representing the um, uh, Council of the European Union Presidency for the next uh, one month uh, at least. And at the same time you also have uh, in interesting experience, uh, not such a long time ago, going through uh, this uh, process. So uh, perhaps you can share uh, with us, uh, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, what kind of uh, experience uh, from the Czech side could be relevant for uh, those countries that we are discussing here and uh, how you are using this experience in, uh, in your, your work, in your work in, in supporting uh, actually all three countries because uh, I know that in your uh, development cooperation you work both in the Eastern Partnership and also in, in Western Balkan countries. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Um, much has been said already, so I, I, I risk repeating some things maybe even when speaking about the Czech experience. As to the actions of Czechia or the Czech presidency during uh, the presidency and regarding enlargement. First, full political support to, to the enlargement, to the European perspective for, for Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and of course not forgetting about the Western Balkans, that's been our priority for years. Uh, we should have conclusions, council conclusions on enlargement in December, so the presidency support the work and the ambitious conclusions, if possible, with clear membership perspective. And in the meantime, in the meantime, we would like to see as much integration into policies, activities, internal market of the partners as possible. So, so we will be, and I will come back to this, we will ask Commission to be active in this regard so that, and this is, this, this is valid not, for, not only for Ukraine but also for Moldova and others, uh, so that we can have everything but institutions in the meantime because the process of enlargement will not be fast and easy. So we can do many things on roaming, uh, university cooperation, trade, barriers to trade, etc., etc. But the first thing that should happen and which would help enlargement, of course, and the situation is uh, helping Ukraine win the war. EU enlargement of EU-like reform, EU reforms. So, uh, first we have to do more of the same. 
<laughs> more, more weapons help to Ukraine, more sanctions, political support helping Ukrainian refugees. And of course, this applies also to Moldova, which is now very vulnerable and the situation is also quite complicated. So, so, so this should be the, the main answer now because with, without this we cannot have much progress on uh, reconstruction of Ukraine and Aki and reforms. On the Czech experience, well, uh, frankly speaking, sometimes I doubt whether we still can share our experience because it, it, it's been already some time ago and uh, Aki is a kind of moving target. So, for instance, now to get visa-free you need to do much more in different spheres than only like passport security, etc. So, so it's a bit, it's, it's a bit tricky. I think definitely you can still learn from our mistakes that are, these are still, still relevant. So I think we are always ready to share and talk about our mistakes done in the process and afterwards and before. Uh, but we do have many bilateral projects still We're working through Czech NGOs. And we have twinning, we have human rights projects, we have transition promotion program of the ministry. We have done a lot during this presidency of the council, so we have organized different events trying to include all Eastern partners, when possible also the civil society from Belarus. So, so we can also share our experience with uh, government coordination on European affairs, of course our experience from the second Czech presidency, etc., etc. But again, I'd like to stress the need to learn from the partners. Mm -hmm. So the Eastern Partnership shouldn't be a one-way street, especially now when we see how much we can learn and we should learn from Ukraine. So definitely this is very important. And of course, the role of civil society has to be stressed. The, the role of the civil society as, as watchdogs in the enlargement process in the partner countries. Uh, and uh, we know how strong the Ukrainian civil society is, and this is also very important. And uh, finally, um, we, would like to, we would like to seek commission, uh, and including the support group for Ukraine, of course. We would like to, to have as open and sincere dialogue with the partner countries, with candidates as possible. Uh, we understand that the commission should have enough resources, meaning also people, but I think the same goes not for, only all the, for, for not only for the EU institutions, but also for the member states, because I think we also face the problem of lack of uh, experts and people working on this file. And as I said, we would like to see as much progress on internal market and other areas as possible. I think it's important to, to look into the experience of the support group for Ukraine and maybe use it also, for instance, for Moldova and Georgia. We need to make sure that we have enough pre-accession funds for all of the partner countries, not only for the Western Balkans. Uh, so this will be quite complicated, as I understand. And uh, last but not least, let me subscribe to what we have heard before many times already today. Uh, the Eastern Partnership is not a substitute or obstacle for the EU integration. So we are happy to work with all the Eastern Partnership countries, but we understand that those that are that are that have made the that have made the most progress have, have to move forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Jan. Uh, I think also very good intervention for uh, uh, facilitating the discussion. Uh, I will come back to some of the points that you, you mentioned. Uh, uh, but now uh, I would like to go back, uh, Peter, to you. Uh, uh, you uh, already mentioned some of the challenges uh, that uh, the Commission has addressed uh, in uh, the uh, enlargement package. And of course, uh, everybody who is here in the room can read this package. It's a very comprehensive document, giving an overall uh, picture uh, where the EU enlargement policy is, but then also uh, going into specific of each country and, and very detailed into reform areas as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, from your point of view and uh, working uh, for your country, uh, understanding where the challenges uh, may lie, uh, could you give maybe three areas where you think uh, Montenegro would have to work the hardest in uh, reaching the, the target? Mm -hmm. Sure, thank yeah. you. Um, well, allow me to just quickly uh, and proudly state uh, what we definitely don't have a challenge with and what we are proud of be doing right, and that is standing in defense of EU values, 
in this uh, decisive moment in our history, and in solidarity with Ukraine, where the b key battle of EU values and the battle which will decide in what kind of Europe we want to live in is being waged. Um, in this sense, Montenegro has, since the beginning of negotiations, held 100% uh, alignment with common foreign and security policy mm -hmm. uh, of the EU. Uh, this was our strategic choice. It hasn't always been easy. Uh, allow me to just give you an example. Uh, we are a um, predominantly tourist country. Uh, a large share of our income relies on a successful summer tourist season. And within that sector, one third of our tourists are traditionally tourists from Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. All three absent now because of Montenegro's continuous 100% alignment and being put on the um, enemy list of the Russian Federation. Um, but we are still doing it because we believe it is the right thing to do. Um, and in addition to this, even though we are a relatively small country, we have granted one-tenth of our defense budget, basically, in military aid to uh, Ukraine. Uh, we are the first country outside of the EU to enact uh, the temporary protection mechanism, just like the one in EU member states, which now allows Ukrainian refugees to have the same access to the labor market, school, etc., for one year time. And we plan to extend this as long as the situation on the ground in Ukraine will necessitate. Uh, and so on and so forth. This is what we really want to write, and all Montenegrin citizens are in favor of this, even though we also have a lively Russian local community of expats in Montenegro, and I'm also proud to say that these two communities, the growing Ukrainian one and the slightly long-standing Russian one, have zero tensions between each other. Um, now, Going back to the annual report and what Montenegro could be doing better, um, let's divide these three groups into um, the title of the movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, where we always need assistance, but uh, where we are still on track is definitely economic governance, so when you speak about Copenhagen criteria. Um, we, for very particular historical reasons, are a country which has had the euro as a currency since the very beginning of the European currency, and so uh, we don't have monetary powers, we relinquish them to the ECB, and it's actually been quite the driver of our economy. Um, in addition to this, in the past two years, Montenegro has uh, gone through a very um, thorough uh, tax uh, and uh, salary reform, which saw a uh, minimum wage rise from 250 to 450 uh, euros a month, and our average salary from 500 to 700, which makes us jump over certain EU member states in uh, income. And the Commission has repeated in this year's uh, report that our public finances are sustainable, so this reform, brave as it is, worked. Um, we are also taking over the presidency from Moldova um, of CEFTA um, next year in 2023 and are the biggest proponent of the common regional market where Western Balkan candidates and potential candidates can practice living in a single market in the run-up to joining the largest single market of the European Union. Um, where we are not really good, but slightly uh, bad, perhaps. Um, and let me just see. Yeah, it's something which I think is the Achilles heel of every accession country currently negotiating nego um, membership, um, administrative capacity. And this is especially true for small countries on both sides of the border. Uh, Montenegro, what Montenegro is facing would not be strange to a public servant in Luxembourg, in Malta, in Cyprus, um, and etc. Slovenia. Um, what uh, German ministry has a zillion units for, we usually have one person in charge of several different portfolios and areas. Um, and we really need to be innovative about how uh, we can tackle the long-standing issue of administrative capacity. For us, it's the chapter 35, basically. Um, 
I was going to put this in uh, uh, at the very end, but uh, let me just say it now so I don't forget about it later because it will be a useful lesson for the Eastern Trio as well. Um, the usual answer you get in Brussels about when you try to tackle admin capacity limitations is, well, you can do twinning projects with member states, uh, you can do TIEX missions to help you learn how to uh, regulate a certain area, and these are all great and fine, and we are very grateful to all member states with whom we've had successful projects with, but what we think smaller candidates really deserve is um, long-term consultancies, where experts from the EU would come and stay with us for longer until we build an institution and educate uh, a class of civil servants mm -hmm. able to independently take over. One thing which has been promised by the Commission as well, and which uh, I can't wait to see how it shapes into a concrete policy, is that they will develop what they call the local tie-ex. Um, don't, let's see what the Commission says, but to me it sounds like in addition to national administrations coming to help um, our national administration, uh, maybe municipalities could also come and help municipalities in candidate countries uh, set up reforms at the local level. And this is really important. Imagine what you could do if you could finance in the very po politically polarized Western Balkan situation, uh, the um, German-speaking community in Belgium to come and teach us directly on instituting uh, participatory democracy tools at the local level, participatory budgeting, citizen assemblies, or basically participatory uh, remedies for the representative democracy malices that mm -hmm. we are facing as countries. Um, this would be tremendous and it would cut the red tape as an instrument, so I'm really looking forward to see um, how it um, develops. Um, Thanks, Peter. No, I think it was interesting because okay. I asked uh, three challenges. You spoke about uh, achievements, which is of course very positive, but there are of course uh, more challenges than just one. Uh, I would just say that of course everybody can read the report that has been produced uh, on Montenegro, and uh, if the audience later wants to address uh, some other questions, of course, they are, they are very welcome. Maybe more, more specific ones on administrate, uh, administration, uh, public mm -hmm. administration reform and also the, the efforts on, on the anti-corruption. Mm -hmm. But I will leave this to the audience okay. uh, later. Okay. Uh, I essentially have the same question to both uh, to our uh, Georgian and um, Ukrainian uh, friends. Uh, in your situation, uh, the, the context is uh, slightly different because you have uh, very concrete things, or more or less concre concrete things that you, you have to do. And I think uh, one of you uh, mentioned that uh, not uh, all of it can be done uh, in, a, in a rush. I think, Mikhailo, it was, it was you because, for example, building a uh, track record on, on anti-corruption probably will take more time than just a uh, just few weeks. At the same time, clearly, I, I hear that there is uh, ambition to do uh, things and, and there is a political will to carry this, uh, this forward. Now, if you look, and now I'm really precise, if you look at uh, those 11 12. steps, or 12, sorry, 12, conditions, or, and, or in the case of Ukraine, seven steps. Perhaps you can tell us with, what of, with, with one or two that you have difficulties with or challenges with, that you need to address, that you are aware, and perhaps also a kind of uh, an approach that you plan to take in, in addressing those, uh, those challenges. That's a really good question because uh, there are always challenges when you work. You find out that there are some challenges and of course I agree that nothing should be done in a rush just to tick a box. Just the main point is that this work is done not only for the EU membership but first of all it is done for the progress of your country, for progress of your society, for integrating to those values which are mostly uh, like uh, valuable for us and we are just trying just to get to that point. Therefore, what has been uh, proposed to us, uh, to Georgia, for faster implementation in reforms, that was quite acceptable. And as I said, 
this mostly was deriving from the association agenda which has been established between Georgia and the European Union. Um, we, uh, we always uh, tried to make this work more participatory. And uh, here, uh, uh, the main challenge, if we say about those challenges which relates to the implementation of this particular um, obligation, uh, derives from this uh, point that part of opposition was always trying to make everything in, uh, how to say, that the government and the ruling party is responsible. Of course, we understand that the ruling party uh, takes more responsibilities than the opposition. However, it does not mean that the only ruling party has all responsibilities and opposition is just criticizing and not participating. And it is uh, some kind of a practice in Georgia that not, uh, not only negotiations, but also our partners, the European Union, when it make some kind of statements um, uh, to join uh, the process because it is for the progress and the sake of the country. It's not for the sake of the government or particular persons. It is for the importance and future of the country. This always makes a sense. Um, what we are facing is that uh, uh, in reality is that mostly these type of statements are done in direction of the government. However, we try to keep door open for all types of relationship. And as I said, we have already achieved a number of very good uh, results from this because we've started negotiations with three opposition parties on particular issues because really it gives a sense on and the direction on real achievements and real goals. And this is uh, also uh, assessed by the civil society, by other partners, uh, and this process, of course, is underway. Uh, when we say about the challenges, we should not, uh, um, uh, I mean, we should remember that Georgia has uh, lots of uh, challenges in general, because first of all, this is a security challenge, because our country uh, is facing a huge threat from the Russian Federation. You are very well aware that more than 20% of Georgian territories are still occupied by uh, Russia, and we have presence, illegal presence, of Russian troops on the territory of Georgia. Uh, one of military base is located just 40 kilometers away from the capital, and this is really a huge threat, and they are uh, daily doing so-called borderization process, kidnapping people from the uh, administrative border uh, line uh, villages, and then it is uh, a huge support from the international society, from the European Union, from our strategic partner, United States, that under a pressure, we try to get back our uh, citizens and to uh, take care of them. Uh, uh, living in such a threat and uh, with the security measures, it's very difficult to uh, proceed with all those activities. However, we are doing our best, and here we need more support from the European Union, more presence of European Union in Georgia, because we are more than committed to have this type of cooperation, and uh, we really look forward that uh, the uh, decision which will be based on particular achievements will be taken next year for granting Georgia the status of candidacy uh, because uh, we have shown and we will show even more that we are very much committed and dedicated to achieve those results which will lead us to get a uh, uh, place in the European family because this is our main goal. And as uh, my colleagues already mentioned, in my country as well, we have more than 80% of population which is supportive to the membership of European Union and the North Atlantic Alliance. And even more, with the previous con uh, con uh, convocation of the parliament, we have amended a constitution and have written in the constitution that the main goal for Georgia is uh, becoming a member of the European Union and the North Atlantic uh, Alliance, which means that we have in the highest uh, level of the uh, legislation uh, written this firm statement which derives from the will of our society's vast majority and this should be appreciated. And this is some kind of a homework for the government, for us, just to fulfill this and we need more support from 
every single member of the European Union, as well as we need support and experience sharing from the candidate countries for whom the uh, uh, doors are now open and we are very happy for you and we welcome this process. However, we need more support to get more closer to Europe and we depend on your support in that direction. Thanks a lot, Kivi. Uh, Mikhailo, you heard uh, this discussion and you heard my question. I uh, hand floor the floor immediately to you, please. Thank you. Is this uh, is the sound better with like this? Yes, it's good. Okay, we can very hear good, you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, very good, thank you. And now, um, the, the question was also, uh, Tunnel, you asked why, why uh, we wanted to do things by the end of the year, uh, many of the reforms of the seven points that we had to do, and um, that was very optimistic to begin with, of course. In theory, it could be doable, but then we would have to, you know, st stop doing everything, including fighting in the front, which we cannot do. Uh, so uh, it's basically it wasn't possible. Um, now, uh, I also have to admit we're already losing some momentum. We're tracking the progress very carefully together with the other uh, NGO partners, and we saw that, you know, say the first three months after the adoption or after the acquiring of the candidacy and the three months after they're very different. One of the reasons we believe is that first, you know, by the decision of the European um, uh, uh, Council and the European Commission, uh, there was uh, a reference that we would, you know, that the, basically the EU would check on us and assess the progress by the end of 2022, but uh, then it turned out that the assessment will in fact be uh, done in 2023, and that removed a lot of pressure, and uh, many things basically stopped uh, or were put on hold. And that's of, that, of course, is not good. If the pressure is there, we tend to be moving uh, more uh, quickly, of course. As for the three areas you asked where the challenges may be, uh, I can answer rule of law, rule of law, and rule of law. It's not only because we deal with these things, uh, and it's important to us, but it's because also the others recognize how important that is, especially the judicial reform, all the, I, I, honestly, a lot of uh, colleagues that deal with other reforms, they say, uh, what you guys do it is, is paramount because, again, you know, a lot of reforms stop it at the corrupt courts, a lot of things are reversed by the uh, uh, very not good law enforcement agencies and so on. And when, when we say three times rule of law, we, well, I mean judiciary, law enforcement agencies, including the anti-corruption ones, and legal education reform. So this is this is kind of the triad that we're looking into, where we, which we absolutely have to tackle. Also because uh, you know uh, um, the, the there's a lot of resistance. Basically, there's a lot of Russian agents still in the rule of law system in Ukraine, in the courts, in the law enforcement bodies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, corruption, obviously, that we have to uh, deal with, and the, the situation would be so much different if we would not have to fight the corruption inside these bodies, so we would not have to fight against the corrupt or at least imperfect uh, legal system, and we, we would have it on our side, basically. And we already have parts of it that, that is already good, the newly established anti-corruption infrastructure, uh, which, which performs fantastically, and of course it's day and night compared to the old unreformed system that we are in the middle of transformation. And of course the corrupt system fights back, and of course they jeopardize a lot of reforms, and that is why I think it's, it's uh, uh, essentially a number one priority. Also because it is, you know, for the oligarchy, it is the way to be if it were not for the imperfect uh, uh, rule of law system, then the oligarchs would not be able to be oligarchs. It's what makes them oligarchs. It's, it's, uh, you know, well, 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 there is rule of law in the country, you, can't, you cannot really be an oligarch. Uh, now, how to help Ukraine do that? Here's the key. Uh, it might seem counterintuitive, but um, there, there is this logic sometimes, and we see it in, in here and there, uh, that, you know, Ukraine's in the middle of the war, and let's not, not go very hard on them, and let maybe, you know, look at the things differently, and let a couple of things slide, it will be okay. And also we want to make things go fast, right? Do not do this. This is a very flawed logic, because, especially with the rule of law, 
First of all, the stakes in the rule of law reforms are very high because right now you say judicial system, right now we have almost half of the vacancies inside the judiciary are, are uh, of the post, judicial posts are vacant. So it is a, a huge opportunity to either draw new blood and uh, include a lot of new uh, people in the system, or if we're not successful with, with the rule of law reform and the way we select the judges and the way we reform the system, to select three more thousand uh, judges, you know, that are not different from the rest of the system. And we will thus cement the uh, current imperfect system for decades to come. So the stakes are very high right now. Those judicial governance bodies that we're selecting now will essentially select uh, 3,000 new Ukrainian judges that will be either the game changer or, uh, you know, what it will basically keep the system uh, as it is. The second reason is, um, that the leverage that we have right now, this EU candidacy and the opening or non-opening of the negotiations is, of course, the highest we, we got in decades, and I don't know how we, will we ever have uh, the leverage as high as, as this one, because 91% of Ukrainian population supports the EU integration. The, the ones that do not are about one or, or two. Uh, the rest undecided, so it's basically below the margin of error, so we essentially Almost 100% of Ukrainian population, we can say, supports the, the EU integration. And of course, what, whatever is necessary for it, the government just has to do it. There's no other way. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, it's exactly, again, it might seem counterintuitive. It's, it's uh, um, going, I'm not to say going hard on us, but not letting slide important things when it comes to judicial reform, being really vigilant and being really firm on the requirements that we have to fulfill is exactly the, the right time uh, to, to do because as soon as the EU says you did the uh, judicial reform good, for example, there will be no turning the back. If, you know, as, as soon as the EU puts this big green check mark next to rule of law reforms, nobody will be able to uh, say, you know, it, it went not good or something else is needed because, again, you know, su such a high seal of approval is a, is a big deal here. Mikhailo, thanks a lot. Uh, I have actually one follow-up question which links back to uh, what uh, Kivi said before, and this is about the anti-oligarchization law or de-oligarchization law uh, in Ukraine and whether this can be modeled for, for other countries. Do you have uh, some thoughts that you can share on that? Because this uh, law has been heavily discussed uh, in Ukraine and also in the international community. Just very, very shortly. Over to you. I will try, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm not an expert on the oligarchization per se, so I, I just only, you know, can kind of look at it from uh, from the side. Um, it has the, the law has ten articles. You know, you cannot fight the oligarchs with ten articles, and the law basically says if you uh, fulfill this and that criteria, we put you on the list. And and the oligarchs, of course, they don't want to be on the list, and that already somehow affects them. But essentially, it does not um, make them an oligarch. What makes oligarchs oligarchs is the monopoly stance on the market and the possibility to meddle with property, with whatever they're meddling with, with the imperfect legal system. So basically, our answer to the oligarchy and our answer for effective de-oligarchization would be A, effective judicial reform, and B, effective anti-monopoly, antitrust legislation and institutions. With that, I believe uh, we could fight uh, oligarchs, and basically oligarchs would be uh, would, would have to just transform to big business people. Uh, but with just putting people on the list, I think it's 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 a start, but it's a it's a half measure uh, at most. Thanks, Mikhailo. Very very useful. Thank you. Uh, Jan, a question to you. Uh, you have worked uh, many years uh, in the council. And uh, you are familiar to the um, process of uh, consensus building uh, on council conclusions and many, many other documents. Uh, you are well aware that any uh, further step on any country on enlargement uh, needs to be built on consensus across the member states. So uh, I would ask from you uh, what would be, in your opinion, the elements uh, that would uh, help to find uh, such a consensus? What kind of uh, uh, 
um, steps, what kind of uh, arguments uh, should uh, our partner countries make in order to convince everybody to, to agree that, uh, that there is indeed time for the, for the next step in any of okay. the countries that we discussed today. Uh, thank you. J just let me note, if we only had such levels of EU support in the EU member states, as, as we heard from Ukraine about 91% support to the EU integration. Uh, on, on your question, well, uh, the, the more the partners deliver, the better for their stance and perception in Brussels among the EU member states. But at the same time, and we have heard this already, we, we cannot avoid this debate on the treaties reform, maybe majority voting, but we also know this is quite sensitive for many many EU member states, many governments, including the Czech one. So, so I don't know, but of course, as we heard, I think this morning from the minister, you can shoot and walk at the same time. So let's work on the reforms, approximation trade, approximation internal market, common spaces of culture, education, science, programs, agencies. And in the meantime, let's build consensus, of course, one day maybe there will be less, now the momentum is here, but it might be complicated in one, two, three years' time. But, of course, the, 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 the faster Ukraine manages to win the war, the better for this process as well. Okay. Good. Thanks a lot, Jan. We have 10 minutes left, for which is, I think, considering all the issues that have been addressed not a lot of time, but uh, I would like to use uh, this opportunity and open the floor uh, to, to questions. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Is there any... Whether... Yes, you can raise your hand yeah. high, very yeah. high, and we can see. Yes, Mal. Is, is it you? Is it you? Yes, good. Hi, uh, Malahela from the Open Estonia Foundation. I just wanted to ask Mihailo, how satisfied are you satisfied with the engagement of civil society in, in consultation processes, process uh, uh, um, regarding uh, accession uh, with European Union? Accession two. Mm -hmm. Uh, generally, yes. Of course, we have a, a lot of good working relation with the, with the EU delegation here in Ukraine and with the EU member states, and we, we have no problem uh, there. Of course, there's, there's another story when it comes to the government um, engagement. They don't always like us, let's put it this way, because again, it's our job to be critical or to move things forward, and maybe they have different views. Uh, but uh, so there is there are problems say in engagement of the civil society to developing uh, things policies legislation whatever it is uh, but uh, when it comes to if, if we're talking about the EU side then then from, no I, I, I wouldn't say we have any problems thank you Kurt yes and Steve Thank you. Mikhaila, uh, well, a question uh, to you from me as well. And first of all, thank you for speaking over the video link and sorry that um, the logistics played a bad trick and uh, didn't work out to, to see you in, in person in Tallinn. But uh, one question I was looking forward to asking you is that we were just with um, colleagues, fellow e, um, Eastern Partnership um, ambassadors from, from EU member states and from Brussels uh, in Yerevan and Baku. And in Armenia, the human rights Ombudsperson told us that she is she is against um, vetting of judges that they have looked at the European sorry at, at the Ukrainian experience and well it's it's a bad one um, the EU delegation there was uh, supporting um, that view as well and as I understand her main argument was that um, vetting the judges is sort of violating the human rights of judges, well, potentially corrupt judges as well. Uh, what's, you have been dealing you know, for, for years with that uh, matter. What's your response to that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, let, let me just very quickly add to my previous answer. Uh, do I think we have enough instruments for the uh, 
civil society to have their kind of voice heard? I also, no, I don't think so. So we, 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 do, we do talk to the EU stakeholders, but of course, if, if, there, if there would be an official platform where kind of the civil society that is deeply involved in the reforms can, can voice out, that would be, of course, better because we have to find out kind of our own um, formats for that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not official. And, and sometimes, you know, the government voice is heard, is heard much more. So, so thank you for, the, for, this, for this question. Now, uh, when, when it comes to the vetting of judges, the only reason Ukrainian experience, let's say part of Ukrainian experience is not uh, very good, is because we gave too much power in vetting the judges to the Ukrainian judges. Because we too early implemented this uh, European standard, by the way, of judicial self-governance, while essentially our um, uh, judiciary is a, while it was a, a corrupt criminal syndicate, and of course it's not it's not a good um, you know policy measure to give a corrupt syndicate self governance and way to um, cleanse themselves and this, and you know no system can essentially cleanse itself. It's problematic. You know you have to you have to do it from the outside. Now in Ukraine we have a very good of course it works. You know the self governance works where you have a good system and you want to preserve it. You know, if you have, you know, a certain EU country, there's lots of them that have around 80% trust of the judiciary, the judiciary works well, of course, why not? Let's preserve it and give them, give the system means to reproduce itself. The judges select those who select the next judges and it goes on and on. Now, when we have problematic judges in Ukraine, when we have hundreds and thousands of judges who are super corrupt, who do not correspond to the integrity criteria, whose decisions are compromised, you give them some governance. Of course, they select, you know, other corrupt people to these judicial governance bodies, and then the system reproduces itself. While it is a good policy measure to keep the system in place, it is a horrible, sorry, policy measure to change the system. So uh, self-governance should come, but after the system was cleansed, after we we are sure, after the system is trusted, and then we should we should do this. So. Uh, we, we, we've been through this very much, uh, you know, in Ukraine. We also heard the stories of how, you know, vetting of judges. Oh, we are, if we ask a judge, I'm a former judge, by the way, just so you, so you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I have experience in there, and, and I and I understand what, where it comes from. Um, when the judges go, oh, we are asked about our property, our rights are violated. No, uh, the, the people's rights are violated when the judges uh, make horrible decisions and throw the innocent protesters in jail and uh, by millions rob the, the population and, and, and billions and so on. So um, by all means, uh, it, please to all ombuds people in the world, I uh, plea look at the human rights of the people and the rights to fair court and fair trial when you assess the judicial reforms and by all means do not um, stand in the way of effective uh, judicial reforms and effective uh, renewal of the judiciary in problematic uh, in countries that have problems with the law. Thank you. Thanks, Mihailo. Stephen, you had a question as well. Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to, uh, to address my question to uh, the member of the, uh, the Georgian Dream Faction in the Parliament, um, whether he could respond to Mihailo's um, well, uh, a reference to the half measure that the Ukrainian anti-oligarchization law really uh, presents um, in, in your situation. The party, of course, um, you know, is dominated or operates in the shadow of what is internationally perceived as the one and only um, billionaire with vested political interests um, in, in the country, uh, Mr. Ivanishvili. And so you will have, I suppose, a very vivid um, political debate within the party how to break those links um, with, um, between politics and business in, in the country. But it not only pertains to uh, the half measure on de-oligarchization, it struck me, of course, that whilst we still have time to, um, uh, to, to adopt further uh, reforms um, with a view to the uh, October 2023 assessment uh, uh, by the European Commission on the 12 priorities, that some of the initiatives which have already been taken, which will be put to ODIR and to the Venice Commission, in fact, do not include some of the observations already suggested by those um, very bodies. 
um, electoral reform, there were uh, references to voter intimidation, uh, government financing of, uh, of political parties, on the creation of a new anti-corruption coordination mechanism, it comes without investigative powers, and, and so it goes on. And so my question is, you know, how, uh, how do you expect basically the European Union and its member states to keep trust that the measures which will be implemented in response to the, per, the 12 priorities will in fact meet their own interpretation um, as to what it takes for a candidate country to become a peer um, member state in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. Uh, I will start with a general overview of what you have already asked about the trust and confidence building. Of course, uh, with every single step and every single activity, what has been done, especially since July when we've started uh, implementation of this 12-point uh, plan, uh, the confidence uh, among the society is uh, increasing because they see it's a very transparent process and they see the uh, real results. And uh, this, re uh, this process is not, uh, how to say, um, done um, uh, uh, in a way that it's done just in the parliament and it is not communicated with our international partners. As I said, civil society organizations' uh, participation, participation of uh, every single uh, responsible agency which is, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, having an expert opinion on that point, is uh, guaranteed and it is uh, there, the presence of this uh, participation. At the same time, we have uh, regular communication with our European Union partners, with uh, embassy representatives, delegation representatives, with the embassy representatives of the countries representing European Union, and this information is on a regular basis exchanged and provided. Um, uh, as I have uh, already mentioned, in a number of cases, we had a situation that we've sent uh, draft bills to the uh, relevant international organizations uh, who presented their opinion uh, or will present their opinion. But it does not mean that they will just work uh, and just present their opinion. They've already carried out um, field visits to Georgia and we had opportunity to meet with them to discuss and consider every single issue um, as well as uh, they had an opportunity to meet with all political groups and uh, uh, re representatives in the parliament as well as civil society organizations or any interested agency they wanted to discuss the issue uh, with. Therefore uh, it is some kind of a, like a complex issue when they just see where is a um, uh, uh, consensus, if it's a consensus-based issue, as well as, uh, for instance, when uh, I had a meeting just 10 days ago with the Venice Commission and the OSCOD representatives as a chair of the working group on election code, they really uh, made a very uh, positive assessment on a point that um, uh, we've uh, left door open even for those opposition parties who from the very initial stage did not participate in the process and now this, this is uh, guaranteed and assured and they are involved in these negotiations and we will proceed with this. However, of course, you can ask um, what is the uh, case when uh, uh, what has been already agreed with them is not presented with the document which has been sent officially to them. However, during those discussions we have concretely and were in very detail informed them where we have already achieved uh, uh, joint agreements and what will be um, uh, taken uh, on board when we will be discussing with the second hearing in detail uh, the, amend uh, the amendments which will be presented uh, to the plenary session. Um, uh, this is somehow a, uh, more or less a similar case in every single direction. And as I said, for instance, if we say about the oversight mechanism, uh, strengthening the capacity of the parliament to use the oversight mechanism, here we had an anonymous uh, support for, from all uh, parties represented in the parliament when uh, we have introduced in the legislation, and it has been already adopted and got into force, related to strengthen the capacity of the parliament with its oversight function. And this makes increase of confidence and trust to the process, first of all. Um, therefore, we are very much committed to continue in this way. As what about the deoligarchization? As you know, there is no experience as such 
what about the legislation. And we were trying just to find what can be a, a deal in this situation. And we found out that the only acting law which exists uh, uh, is a Ukrainian law adopted a year ago. Uh, we've also uh, went quite deeper in this process, defining that this uh, document has been developed in uh, with participation of European experts, then uh, it was positively assessed by the European Commission, but later it was sent to the Venice Commission. So it is important and crucial for us to get uh, uh, opinion of the Venice Commission on this law, because it's the same what, uh, what we will have in Georgia, and we will definitely consider and take on board those recommendations which the Venice Commission will be providing to Ukraine. At the same time, um, uh, you mentioned about uh, Bizina Ivanishvili, uh, um, we, like any law cannot be, uh, how to say, uh, uh, any law cannot be uh, developed uh, um, related to some person. It is a general law, and there are special criteria. Any person who falls under those criteria can be fall, falling uh, within the framework of this uh, law. And uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, this case, it is quite an uh, easy issue because uh, this person who has established uh, the ruling party some um, 11, 12 years ago, um, he was a prime minister, you know very well, and then he removed from the uh, politics, and later he returned as a chair of the uh, ruling party. But two years ago, he finally, finally left the politics, and none of person can present any single evidence of his presence in the politics. He has, in, uh, he has just uh, um, publicly made a statement that he has no sense to be part of any kind of political issues, and therefore, if he or anyone else falls under those criteria which will be adopted by the law, then there will be a special registry, and those persons will be put in that registry. However, when we talk about the particular case, the opposition was, uh, first of all, they were saying that the Ukrainian uh, uh, law is very good. When they found out that we are translating this law and it goes directly in line what is uh, adopted by Ukraine, they found out that they have several people in their party who um, uh, gets to those qualification criteria. And now they dislike this law and they are arguing. So it's a matter of consideration. However, here we need additional expert support and opinion from our partners. As well, and as I said, we are uh, waiting for the Venice Commission uh, expert opinion, which will be uh, in a very detailed considered and discussed, and we will see how it will go. Thank Kiwi, you. thanks a lot for this extensive uh, answer, and of course, uh, feel free to discuss this uh, with uh, Stephen further. Now, uh, actually, I had a plan to give to everyone a uh, uh, floor for the, the last remark, but we are a little bit late with, uh, with our panel. We also started a bit later, but I would still like to, as uh, Kivi and Mikhail already spoke, I would still like to give the uh, floor to you, Jan, and to you, Petar, and just uh, a very short answer to a very concrete question. I mean, actually, both of you already addressed this, but uh, what kind of suggestion should I, as a commission representative, take back to Brussels what we should do in helping candidate country like uh, Montenegro, but also other candidate countries to fulfill those steps, fulfill those conditions to, to go to the, to the next step? Very short. Very short. Yeah. Uh, in addition to helping those at the back of the line of accession, which we are doing now, we need to help those who are in front because accession will be based on those who make it across the finish line. Uh, so uh, help uh, Montenegro break the rule of law blockade it has in the parliament now with any means possible, because the citizens are ready, the administration is ready, we need to just unblock our parliament. And um, in, I echo all candidate and potential candidate countries, we need Brussels to speak with one voice mm -hmm. to us. We have different institutions having varying messages. We need a one voice. We need a clear orientation. That's it. Thanks. Jan? But I'm not sure whether 
tunnel can can provide this or assume. Well, I take. I just this, asked what I will take uh, take with me. I mean, you it does can, not mean can, that I have a silver bullet solution to that. But you uh, can do your best. But this is the member states who are yeah. in charge of unity, of yeah. course. But but I think, uh, as I said, more of the same. And let's let's help Ukraine win the war, and let's have some good policy of no business as usual with Russia, and let's hope that we will be able to contain Russia, and then we will have space for reforms and help to Ukraine, Moldova and others. Mm -hmm. And uh, please tell them that they can count on the Czech presidency and then they can count on the Swedish presidency. Yes. I see that uh, Mikhailo raised his thumb up. I think this is the, the best signal to, to end this panel. Of course, uh, I think this is our everybody's uh, wish and, and, and strong hope that, uh, that Ukraine will win this uh, war uh, very soon and uh, from our side, uh, from everybody in this room and, uh, and, and beyond, we, of course, uh, continue to support you, Mikhailo, and, uh, and, and your, your colleagues and your people. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, attention. Um, it was a very interesting discussion. I think that now we are uh, about to start the concluding session, which will probably summarize this and some other discussions before. Thank you very much. Ambassadors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, well, it's been a long day, but um, enlightening and exciting discussions. Um, I hope you, you are all agree with that. Um, let me very briefly try to summarize the day, what I would um, take away from it. Uh, first of all, our determination to help Ukraine win the war, the, the thing Tanel concluded with, um, our well, especially on, on such a day, again, uh, starting uh, with an attack on the maternity ward in Zaporizhia in the morning, um, then, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say ending, but, well, uh, let's say, um, uh, as many of you might have seen already, um, attacks, uh, missile attacks all over the country, and uh, including Kiev, and um, electric electricity missing in a big part of the country, in neighboring Moldova as well. So, um, uh, obviously, we have to unite our forces, and the um, Minister was uh, clear about it, and I'm sure that um, no participant here um, harbors any doubts about it or, or thinks any, any differently. Uh, the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister, Olha Stefanishina, uh, also left us with uh, no doubt regarding the determination of Ukraine to succeed to win the war and to become a member state of the European Union. Um, there are areas, as it was pointed out uh, by Jan, uh, my Czech colleague, where we can already learn from Ukraine. Um, we also heard that Moldova and Georgia are concentrated and determined as well to, to accomplish everything um, that is um, expecting, expected from them and that their own people are expecting from the governments. We heard that it's a responsibility for the candidate countries to keep working, uh, to keep reforming, uh, not least the judicial reform that Mihailo Zhernakov was talking about. Um, and as uh, Kalinka Gaber said um, the EU should also require a lot from candidates or, as my colleague uh, from the Netherlands, Jan Frederiks, reminded, uh, we need reforms in candidate countries to, to convince our own parliaments. At the same time, the EU should be credible in its approach to enlargement. Uh, yes, it's difficult to achieve because the EU has 27 member states. Uh, you need unanimity on decisions. Um, for decisions on enlargement, but, uh, and well, actually, unfortunately, there is no way to sanction uh, those member states who do not behave well. 
um, I'm afraid. Uh, but the EU still should be credible, and the presence of North Macedonia here today, of course, is, um, is a good reminder in itself. So, all in all, it's a trust-building exercise, as um, Stephen Blockman put it. Um, then we heard that we should not revise the recently revo uh, revised enlargement methodology, or that we should. Uh, the debate still remains open on that. And then we heard that we need to keep the Eastern Partnership. It's still relevant. We need more differentiation, more work on security, on resilience. We need connectivity physically, linking the area, transport, energy, digital connections. And we'll keep discussing and we'll keep using the instrument in the foreseeable future as well. Uh, perhaps my main takeaway as being part of the organization of the event as well, is that um, indeed it was a good idea to put um, representatives from the Western Balkans and the Eastern Partnership countries on the same stage. Uh, there are certainly comparable experiences and, um, well, it's difficult to predict the future always, but I hope we'll uh, keep doing that in Estonia as well. So, um, Kalinka, Petar, uh, thank you very much for coming over and, and joining the discussions. Before concluding, let me thank all those who have made um, this conference possible and who have helped it along. Uh, first of all, of course, all the panelists and, and the moderators. Then the Swedish Embassy Ambassador uh, and the European Commission representation in Tallinn. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Um, then I would like to thank the volunteers from the Estonian School of Diplomacy, the students, and also the, the School of Diplomacy for letting um, the students skip the classes uh, for the day and, uh, and help us with, uh, with the conference. Um, I would like to thank all of you who have stayed bravely until the end, which um, brings me to the next person in line, namely the current EU presidency, uh, the Czech Embassy, who will reward all those uh, brave participants shortly. But uh, before that, I will leave the floor to the Czech Charge uh, d'Affaires, uh, Petr Pratik. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since I'm the last obstacle standing between you and the uh, very well deserved glass of wine. I'll, I'll keep my intervention very brief. It's been an honor after a year again to partner up with the conference on Easter partnership and especially so under the auspices of the Czech presidency in the EU. Throughout the presidency we promoted coordination on all levels and I believe the number of meetings, conferences and consultations we organized and co-organized uh, is witness to this fact. Many of these meetings uh, did not, did not lead directly to hard and tangible results. But as the Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kala said when returning from Prague from the first meeting of the European uh, political community, it's the discussion in itself which is worthwhile and which, which has its merit. Uh, I'm sorry, my cell phone <laughs> got stuck. But uh, anyways, uh, what, what I wanted to say is that we really appreciate all the speakers and all the, all the participants in the today's conference which took part and, uh, and contributed with pertinent questions and their contributions today. So the thank you belongs to the ICDS, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia, to the Swedish Embassy and to all who have made this conference possible. And now it's my pleasure to invite you for a glass of Czech wine, which awaits us in the foyer. So once again, thank you very much for uh, participating today. Thank you.